<laughs> okay, um, I'd like to bring the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals meeting for November 27th, 2012 uh, to order. Um, I am occupying uh, the chairman slot for the first time, so this should be a lot of fun for everybody. Um, I guess first off, uh, why don't we uh, approve the, uh, the minutes for October 23rd, for the last meeting. Um, we do have um, some revisions to those minutes that uh, Chris uh, handed out a few minutes ago. I don't know if everybody's had a chance to look at them. Um, yeah, Chris, you have... Sure, I, I can provide a, a high-level comment on the, the revisions, but obviously everyone should review them before we, we vote on them. But a, a, as a general matter, basically, uh, we'll take them one at a time. A, a, as a uh, high-level, my view, whenever there's a disputed uh, issue where it's not a unanimous decision, we think that as a best practice, we should try to note who voted in which direction on each vote. So that's one revision that I added was doing my best to identify who voted for each item. So please make sure I didn't get that wrong. But it seemed to me that it was good to include in the record uh, who voted for what to the extent that it is needed later on. Uh, otherwise, I added additional detail to the discussions, uh, to the, the description of the board discussion on the different issues. Uh, I felt that I wanted my reasoning on defining what the normal high water of, uh, normal high, actually there's a typo there, normal high line of coastal waters um, meant and how I came to a conclusion on that. To the extent that that influenced anyone else on the board, it seemed like that should be in there. So I further in, uh, provided detail based on the video of what was said uh, on that issue. Uh, beyond that, on um, the other appeal regarding the Goldman's property, I believe it was, uh, I added further detail uh, from the video as to the, the discussion and a number of the different points that were made uh, that I, I, I deemed important to have it in the actual, re reflected in the, the paper record here, uh, including the observations for me that from the the chair that there was a way to harmonize the ordinance. And so I made, I made sure that that was reflected here. And then I, uh, there was a little back and forth on the vote, so I added in additional detail, uh, made sure that it reflected that uh, detail in the back and forth that occurred with the vote. Uh, beyond that, on the last issue with the timeliness, uh, given the fact that it's come up a couple times, uh, and this version that I have here is truncated, but. Uh, the last couple pages, I uh, made sure that the minutes reflected the comments that I had made regarding timeliness, mm -hmm. and which were reflect. Uh, basically, I reiterated what the the arguments that had been raised previously to the board in the prior issue uh, that had been on appeal the month before, and the advice that we had received from council. Which, to summarize, because of the fact that at least in mine it's missing, I hope the rest of you had page 22 and 23. Um, Basically, it was, uh, there was the case cited to us that said, that we were told said, um, it's a judicial decision, it is not an administrative decision, and iterated the reasons why. So, and I raised that as part of that uh, appeal and wanted to make sure that was reflected in the record as well. So that's a broad, high level uh, overview, but obviously each of you should review the minutes. Um, I think everything that got handed out was through page 18 or 19, so um, I, I, I think given the fact we've gotten the revisions 10 minutes ago and um, have, yeah. have, half, have two thirds of the revisions, we probably should table the approval of the minutes for the next meeting. Anyone want to make a motion to that effect? I moved that was a motion and I said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all in favor? Aye. Okay, the minutes of October 23rd have been tabled until the next meeting. Um, 
Uh, I guess a housekeeping item, uh, a couple actually, but uh, just relative to the agenda, um, the uh, uh, under new business, the, uh, the request for a variance by Glenn and Rachel Reeves, um, that uh, variance request has been withdrawn. So that is not on tonight's agenda. Um, also, I uh, will defer to my fellow members here, but after looking at the materials, um, we might want to move the uh, request for variance by uh, Jackie and Jeff Dennis up to the front of the pack um, rather than the end of the pack. Anyone have any thoughts otherwise? Would that require the, uh, uh, the other individuals who have appeals before us to agree to that, given that we basically are ta putting them on the table yet again, and some of these have been going on for three meetings? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I mean, I would just maybe suggest that we take up the old business. Agreed. No, I, 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 I'm sorry. We should move into the front of the new business pack, I guess is Got what it. I was. Okay. Um, okay. Also, uh, I guess now turning to old business, uh, uh, Attorney Wall had uh, sent over a um, memo uh, earlier today, and I just asked, uh, I asked him earlier if he could brief the board on a review of the administrative appeal process. Attorney Wall. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hopefully you all received a copy of the, the memo. Um, it was prompted in part by some, by some of the discussions at the last meeting, uh, seeking clarification um, based upon the standard of review as to what, if any, um, deference the board needed to give to any determinations made by the CEO. Um, I did some additional research on that. Um, as my memo indicates, I think the law court has moved away from a um, the modified sort of review process, unless it's uh, very explicitly set forth in an ordinance that that's what's required. Um, and in reviewing the language of CAPE's ordinance, I don't believe that the language is explicit enough to follow what the law court is doing in that regard. So therefore, uh, I still believe it's a de novo review, but um, based on my, my review of the case law, I don't believe there's any requirement of deference to the CEO's determination. So that means it's a, as if the matter came to you in the first instance, you review the evidence that's submitted to you by all the parties. Obviously that evidence may include materials that were submitted originally to the code enforcement officer, but you make your own determination independently as to whether or not you believe the materials that are submitted uh, in terms of um, information provided by witnesses or documents of that type of nature nature um, either support the, um, that the request for a permit, for example, is compliant with the ordinance or not. That's a determination you make without any deference to what occurred below. In, in this, um, the, the advice you're providing us now, this would be applicable for the instances where we had a, where we addressed the substance of the appeal, not the instances where we were dealing with the timeliness of the appeal. Is that right? Well, the timeliness is a different issue. That goes really just to your, your own jurisdictional. So, uh, so uh, the, the advice you're giving us now is applicable to, and I may be misplacing one here, but I think we had two appeals in the last meeting or two that it would be applicable to? Is that it, it goes to the substance of, of, sure. the, of an issue. So my, uh, I'm going to try to summarize what you just told me, and to the extent I get it wrong, please, okay. please correct me. So. We had two issues before us where in both instances we upheld the decision of the code enforcement officer while purportedly applying a uh, more deferential standard than the proper standard. Is that correct? No, I think what actually happened was your vote indicates that you were denying the appeal. Mm -hmm. uh, among the findings, um, based upon uh, the information I provided you previously, um, you'd indicated whether or not you believed there was any uh, clear error on the part of the code enforcement officer. Um, with the idea that there was some implicit deference to be accorded under those circumstances. Um, my review of the evolution of the case law suggests that in order for that standard to continue to apply in, a, in a, a city like Cape Elizabeth, it has to be very explicit in the ordinance that that's what's 
contemplated a hybrid sort of review? So based on the votes that we took, the votes that we took in those two instances, we gave the CEO's decision more deference than it is supposed to be accorded. Is that correct? Well, obviously, that, that goes to your own state of mind in terms of your decision. But Look, looking at the wording of our decisions, I, I mean, I, I'm seeking advice from you on, on this point. But looking at the wording of the votes, is it? I, I recall there being the phrase clear error, so on and so forth. And it, it sounds like what you're saying is that was the incorrect standard. I, am I wrong on that, or am I right on that? I, 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 I believe that it's a more deferential standard than is what is actually required by CAPE's ordinance. And so on. in both of those instances, we were, we, assuming I have the language correct, we were applying an overly deferential standard and didn't overturn the CEO's decision. Instead, we upheld it. Is that? I, I don't, which one did we overturn? Did we overturn the um, I, I thought steps? It, no, that, that no. ended up no. went back and forth, and then it was 4-3. So I guess my question then is, at that point, do we, is there anything we, we can do at this point, or do we just we no, sit tight? No, there's nothing you can do at this point. So we just sit tight. Right. All right. It, okay. So I guess uh, outs uh, on the questions where I was in the majority, or just for me personally, where I was in the majority, uh, I know, is there any mechanism where I have the ability to revisit a vote where I was in the majority? Um, you can always move to reconsider as a is member there a of the time majority. For making that move to reconsider? I would have to double check the ordinance, but I don't believe so, not from the board's perspective. But I would have to double check the ordinance because if, if there was a time period, obviously it's going to be provided in there. And obviously, if we move to reconsider, we probably would need all of the involved parties here. Yes, but I, I mean, uh, the evidence wouldn't be any different because, again, you were already conducting a de novo review. Mm -hmm. So the question only becomes from a voting standpoint whether or not that changes your perspective as to whether or not your vote was based upon so, deference as opposed to your own evaluation. So our, our evidentiary findings would remain untouched, presumably. Exactly. It's the conclusions drawn from those findings. Exactly. So the question would be uh, for the, we, we have the 7 0 vote uh, involving. Um, the reduction in size of the patio is how I will broadly describe it. So that one we would have to decide to the extent that we reopened it was under the proper standard, uh, what was, the, the, was it proper for the permit to have been issued? And then also for the 4-3 vote, we would have to decide if that, uh, we would no longer be applying the uh, clear error standard, instead it would be, was the permit properly issued under the ordinance. Uh, or, or more, I think more precisely, what you're it's, looking it's, at is, uh, does the permit request conform, comply with the ordinance? You don't think <coughs> of it in terms of an issue being appropriately granted or not. You look at it, does the request being made by the permit conform to the ordinance? Well, with that, I would move to reopen the vote that we had 4-3 on the permit where it was upheld relating to these steps. I don't know if there's a second. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Vote. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. So two four? Two four. Right. Fair enough. And just for completeness, I'll also move that we reconsider our uh, seven oh vote on um, the reduction in size of the patio. Do you broadly describe it? I assume everyone knows the exact appeal that I'm referring to. We'll call it the 7 0 vote. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Is there a second for that? I'll second it. All in favor? All opposed? Okay. Excuse me. Uh, could you give us a reason why you just did that? I'm just kind of curious, but just based upon Mr. Wall's uh, brief or, or comments. So, so basically, and to the extent I get this wrong, if Mr. Wall can correct me, is uh, my understanding is what the advice we just received, and, and again, this is the advice from him, and I'm just trying to paraphrase it as best I can here, uh, is that um, we, we applied an overly, overly deferential standard in deciding whether there was an error by, by the CEO in issuing the permits. And in both of those instances, we said, no, there was no error. If we had said there had been an error and we had already been overly deferential, that would have been one thing. But because of the fact that we were overly deferential and said there was no error, to me, it seems like we need to at least 
rediscuss and revote on those issues, especially with the 4 3 vote, where I'm still somewhat befuddled how we reached that conclusion given our findings of fact. Can I clarify, too, that what I heard was that to the extent people were in their decision making process and considering the evidence, thinking that they had to apply a standard that said that we had to give deference to the code enforcement officer and that that was determinative in their own deliberations, then perhaps that standard was inaccurate. But for some people, they may not have been, you know, the evidence would not, that we were considering would not change. It would be the more, more the internal mechanism that you were using in your decision making process. And speaking for myself and myself only, I would say that I was not utilizing a standard that was unduly deferential. Yeah. It, it, into the, I, for me, the decision as to whether it should be reopened is to the extent that it seems that there were people on the board who were uh, applying that standard. And having gone through the minutes recently, there were multiple comments made during the meeting as to what is the standard, what is the standard, what is the standard. And it seems like, to me at least, looking at the minutes, looking at the video, having reviewed it in the last couple of days, there were numerous comments made as to what is the standard. We're reviewing this uh, looking for clear error, where it seems like that was the improper standard, so we should re be retaking the vote. And that's why I moved to reopen the vote. But Okay, thank you. Does that, does the vote stay as it is, or? We should, we should have had this discussion prior to just having that prior vote. Did we just vote? We, we just took a vote. Uh, we should have had this discussion prior to the vote, in my opinion. Perhaps. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> I hate to even ask this question. Is there a, a, a reconsideration of the vote? Hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, okay, uh, next on the agenda is communications. Uh, we got a notice that um, of, uh, of uh, an appeal uh, by uh, the, the Murphys versus uh, the Livingstons in uh, Superior Court, uh, of which uh, both uh, the town and the zoning board uh, of the town are, are a part of that uh, uh, action. And uh, that obviously stems from our meeting of the 23rd, or is it September? Well, one of the two. So just to give everybody a FYI on that. Uh, Let's see. I think that can. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I jumped. I jumped ahead, and I apologize. Um, uh, the other old business is to uh, hear uh, the uh, administrative appeal of the Shore Acres Improvement Association um, on the issuance of building permit 130072 that allows the construction of a boulder wall and deposit of fill within the Shore Acres community deeded right of way at 29 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 69. Uh, why don't we uh, hear from uh, the representatives of the Shore Acres Improvement Association, Mr. Mora. Uh, Mr. Bryant. Yes. <clears throat> uh, my name is Richard Bryant, and I've been engaged to represent the Shore Acres Improvement Association, <clears throat> which is a voluntary nonprofit association that represents the interests of lot owners in the Shore Acres subdivision and, uh, and adjacent property. And those, <clears throat> excuse me, those members of the association uh, hold easement rights over Surfside Avenue which is a paper street that uh, the town holds incipient rights on as well. The street is shown on the 1911 Shore Acres subdivision plan. Um, and I do have copies of a number of materials I'll be referring to. I believe they're in your materials already. If not, I have multiple copies to pass out. What I've asked the uh, secretary to distribute to you right now are two things. <clears throat> One is a set of photographs uh, of the site in question. And we'll go through those in detail a little later. And also a Google map uh, uh, photograph, a satellite photograph, that shows the site with some lines imposed upon it to help orient the board to uh, various property lines and setbacks and so forth. 
Um, in this appeal, uh, the permit was issued on August 31st uh, to the Livingstons for uh, 29 Pilot Point Road, which is tax map U12, lot 69. Um, and the permit itself was for the replacement of a 50 by 25 foot deck or patio attached to the house by a 20 by 20 foot patio attached to the house. In addition, the permit itself said uh, there would be regrading to restore grass slash vegetation in disturbed areas. Temporary erosion control measures include a silt fence. Permanent erosion con measures, control measures including retained, retaining boulder wall to prevent further erosion and water runoff over a crumbling ledge on the east side. You should have a copy of that permit application in front of you. Again, if not, I'm happy to provide you with a copy. And you'll find that description that I just read from, uh, I believe, on the second page of the application. Can you show me a picture of it? Just to make sure I'm looking at the right document and page. Yes. Copy right there. Let me get to it. This is the permit. The second page has the description that I just read from at the top. I believe we do not have a copy. Okay. And I have plenty of copies. I think the board all has a copy of that now. Uh, you'll see it has several other pages attached. If you uh, page back from the second page with the description, you'll see a sketch plan, which was submitted by the Livingstons. Uh, then you'll see a fax cover sheet, a building permit itself, and then another sketch plan, which was a subsequent sketch plan that alters a few provisions. I also found in the town file, and I'm not certain if they were formally uh, revisions to the application, several other plans, which again, I have copies of. I know Mr. Livingston's attorney has a copy of. I have copies of those as well, if you like. Those include items that were, I know, an issue and were presented at the appeal on other matters by other um, uh, opponents last month on the 23rd of October. Those include uh, two versions of an existing site plan by uh, Mr. Fisher's Northeast Civil Solutions. Again, I can provide those if you don't have them handy. They'll be useful later on. It's, looks like you need those as well. And just to clarify, my, my understanding there was an issue at the last meeting as to commingling of the records, and it was requested that there be no commingling of any of the, the evidence from any of the other related appeals. So, it, we have it, actually reached oh, have you? Okay, great. All right. So, to the extent you could uh, tell us what documents we can be commingling, that would be helpful. Yes, I will. Um, Mr. Schumadine informed me that his uh, client's expert was witness Mr. Fisher from Northeast Civil Solutions uh, was called down to Boston for another engagement and could not be here tonight. I spent a number of hours going over the videotape of Mr. Fisher's testimony and I understand the method he used to establish a still water level datum and from that to uh, determine a still water elevation of the highest uh, astronomical tide. 
So I understand how he reached the points which he purports to depict on his site plans, and I have no objection to that method. I won't be challenging that method. I know there was a misunderstanding among a number of people last time. If there's others who have an objection to that, who may be speaking today, I can't speak for them, but from the association's perspective, I don't have a problem with the board relying upon the testimony of Mr. Fisher presented in the appeal on October 23rd regarding how he reached the datum uh, and the elevations that are shown on these existing conditions plans that I've just distributed to you. I think that's, that's accurate. Uh, well, I think the way I would phrase it as all of his testimony relating to that issue is part of this proceeding as well as part of the other proceeding. Thank you. All right, now, um, there will be another preliminary method, excuse me, matter that I think I've discussed with Mr. Schumann and I and we might have to address. I will quickly jump to that. I do want to point out that before I get to the question of standing, which is an issue we need to discuss, apparently based upon Mr. Schumann's representations to me, that the application for the permit um, Comply, does not comply with the ordinance. Uh, and I would just step you through the provisions of the ordinance that get us to the, to the application and to the timeliness of our appeal, thence to the uh, issue of standing. Ordinance uh, section 1933A requires a building permit for any structure. And the structure is, def is a defined term at section 1913 as anything built for support of any kind together with any constru anything constructed with a fixed location uh, on or in the ground, which obviously includes the retaining wall that's discussed in this uh, permit application. Ordinance section 1933B requires that no building permit be issued without compliance with all the provisions of the ordinance. And then ordinance section 1933C requires that a permit application include a site plan showing structures, property lines, and compliance with setbacks. Those are all part of what should be included in the application. I'll demonstrate later on tonight that those were not complied with in this instance uh, by the permit that's being appealed. Now, our appeal was timely filed on the 25th of September, within the 30-day uh, appeal period required under the ordinance. And I contend standing was proper. Included in the uh, appeal packet was a recreational easement deed that was conveyed in 1991 over Surfside Avenue from the Shore Acres Land Company, which was the original developer of this subdivision back in 1911. Uh, they conveyed out deeds for various lots uh, for eight decades, and then in 1991 uh, gave a deed to, if not all, then virtually all of the property owners within the Shore Acres subdivision, uh, which granted a recreational easement over Surfside Avenue as shown on the plan. The issue that arise in, arises here is that Mr. Schumadine has alerted me that they will challenge the validity of that recreational easement uh, and that it and indicate that it does not convey any rights over Surfside Ad Avenue that are adjacent to the Livingston property, that is between the Livingston lot as shown on the plan and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, to that effect, I'd like to point out a couple facts. One is that uh, that deed is not the only uh, basis on which members of the association have easements rights over Surfside Avenue directly adjacent to the Livingston lot. Um, I actually went to the Registry of Deeds and I uh, did a simple research involving the conveyances by the Shore Acres Land Company for 80 years, from 1911, from the first deeds out in this lot until recently. <clears throat> and what I discovered that is that in addition to this conveyance in 1991, broadly to most, if not all, the members of the, broad, of the uh, Shore Acres community, um, from the very beginning, the conveyances by the Shore Acres Land Company gave specific deeded rights for passage over the streets and ways as shown on the recorded subdivision plan in addition to conveying out the lot itself. So there are three ways to, for generally speaking, to obtain private rights in 
the ways that are shown on a subdivision plan. One is by implication. I get a deed from the developer that says, I'm giving you lot one on my subdivision. And that subdivision plan shows a road that gets me to the public road, even though the deed doesn't say, together with the right to travel over the roads shown on the plan, by implication, uh, the grantee of a lot within that subdivision obtains rights in that road. That's a common law uh, doctrine. It has recently, relatively recently, been codified and addressed in some ways in statute. So there is a statutory provision now that says when somebody after 1987, I believe, conveys a lot in a recorded subdivision plan, then these certain rights go along with that lot, including rights over, over streets and ways shown on the plan, subject to certain restrictions. The third way for private rights to exist within a, a right-of-way like Surfside Avenue here is for that actual deeded conveyance. And that right, which exists in any number of lots, I cannot say all the lots, I believe likely a majority of lots, but if not, then a substantial minority of lots in the, surf, in the uh, Shore Acres subdivision. Those rights are in the chain of title of, of each of those deeds, and if necessary, one could trace them up. May I interrupt you for a Please. second? Um, I would like to limit the discussion tonight with regard to you know, underlying title issues such that that's not something that we have the authority to consider or resolve except as it pertains to the standing issue? Correct. Perfectly fine. And, and in my uh, perspective, the, e the easement deed that's included in the appeal application, called a release deed in, in, in its title, is sufficient prima facie evidence of easement rights along Surfside Avenue to meet the very low bar of standing for an appeal in this sort of administrative appeal. However, yeah. I am prepared to provide you with copies of deeds, sample deeds from, from the Shore uh, Acres Land Company, which give specific deeded easement rights over Surfside Avenue from back in 1911 through the 1940s. I've actually done, also done a compendium of deeds for a specific lot, the Murphy's lot, which came out in 1947. And I have copies of all those deeds all the way up to the Murphy showing that there was no release along the way of those deeded easement rights over all of Surfside Avenue. So I can, that's an offer of proof to establish that we do have standing for members of the association. And I guess that's my, kind of my other question on the standing issue is assuming that it's accurate that the low bar is met with regard to let's call it right title and interest sufficient to establish standing for the members of the association, of which I should probably say that I am not, but I certainly am a resident of the Shore Acres subdivision, um, that how does that flow to the association? Well, the association is a voluntary association of its members whose purpose is to take action to, uh, for the betterment of the Shore Acres subdivision. So acting as an agent for those members rather than have 50, 60 people stand up here and sign that, uh, that appeal application, the association has acted on, uh, through its board and its officers to file the appeal on behalf of its members because it serves its corporate purpose as agents for the property owners within Shore Acres Subdivision. And, and just to be clear, so are, are you saying that one of the board members has an is being represented in effect by you or not? I'm Just saying that I, I represent the association. The association and is one of the board acting members, uh, as the agent so of. What, what, what makes one a member of the association? One has to be, is it has to own property within the Shore Acres or adjacent property, and one has to pay a membership due. Got it. So, and you do not pay membership dues. Right. Okay. Are both parties a member? <coughs> Excuse me. Are both parties a member of the association? So far as I know, the Livingstons are not members of the association. Are you? Okay. The admin. Stand corrected. I've, I've not reviewed the, the membership list, so I don't know. Tell me about the, the meeting when you had a vote on this to hire you to come forward on this complaint. I presume you had a board meeting? Uh, the, the board met, and I was informed that the board had been authorized to engage me to represent the association. The association itself filed the appeal, um, the pro se. But, you, but it's something you can't touch, an association. I'm just wondering about the... Uh, you know, how it went about making this decision. You said by a, by a board vote, or was it by a general membership? 
I don't know the specifics of that. I didn't attend. I'm trying to think about the authority you have to do this. Well, the, the association exists as a legal entity, and it has officers, and those officers are entitled to act on behalf of the entity. Now, but, but just having gone back to, to just to be clear, membership is a voluntary membership that no board members present tonight are members of. So. I think that issue is addressed yes. from, from my perspective. That's accurate. And if we could just short circuit uh, just for a moment what you were addressing. Is the Livingston's property listed anywhere in Schedule A? Um, what do you have? I'm not certain, but I do believe that the Livingston's deed has specific deeded rights in Surfside Avenue as well. It may be. I, haven't, I really haven't checked that. I, I, I guess for me at least it would be uh, dispositive if the Livingston's or a pro their lot, a uh, predecessor in interest, was a member of this release deed. So my question is, are they in here? Because if they're not, that's a different story than if they are. Okay. Lot, I'll lot 69. But it's lot six, yeah. So U12 lot 69, right? Don't the, see it. The difficulty with that, <clears throat> with that release deed, is it combines both tax map and lot numbers with lot numbers as shown on the Shore Acres plan. For example, number 26 says lot 68 and 69, but that's of the Shore Acres plan, not the tax. Correct, lots. correct. So the lot numbers that the Livingstons have, I believe, are 3 and 18 and a part of lot 2. Can you repeat that? I apologize. Sure. Uh, on the Shore Acres plan, the Livingstons lot is lot 3 and lot 18 and a portion of lot 2. And as you know, it's lot 69 on the uh, tax map U12. But to the best of your knowledge, they're not listed in here. I just haven't okay. looked to see. Right. I didn't have an interest to see. I, don't see um, I did look at the Livingston's deed, and I do see that they have deed adjacent rights in that area. But I, I just haven't checked that. I can ask members of the board here um, if they might look through the materials rather than hold up. For now, I'm going to be operating on the assumption that theirs is not listed in here. So if you could continue on with uh, very briefly, uh, staying away from the, the ownership of land issues that we, that, uh, we otherwise had, had mentioned here, and instead just address why there is, in fact, standing. There is standing because members of the association, including board members here, uh, do have easement rights over all of Surfside Avenue. And your argument is they have it based on uh, a statute of some sort that was enacted. Three separate ways, in fact. So one way let's, is Let's the, side, set aside the release deed, because okay. the, the- He may challenge that. I disagree. Okay. I think it's valid. And Although- it's Valid on its face. I, I'd, I, I'm not going to go into whether it's valid or not, but if the Livingstons aren't listed in the- If the predecessors in interest for the Livingstons are not in the release deed, I don't see how this in any way impacts them. Well, I think what you may be misunderstanding right. is Please that explain. the conveyance by the Shore Acres Land Company to the predecessors in interest to the Livingstons conveyed them lots 3, um, 18, and a portion of lot 2. It did not convey to them Surfside Avenue as shown on the plan. All right. So title to, to so all of Surfside Avenue remained in Shore Acres Land Company, and that was the entity that conveyed out an easement over their fee interest to the various lot owners under that release deed. So the argument is that Surfside Avenue itself was owned by the land company at the time the release deed was executed. And uh, because of the fact that the Shore Acres Land Company had the interest at that point in time, when they conveyed this easement, they, in effect, conveyed the right to all of, uh, I'm going to butcher the name, Surfside Avenue or whatever the paper street is. Uh, As described in that deed, it. yes. So it, from that perspective, your position is that it's irrelevant that what, uh, if the Livingston's predecessors and interest signed up. Exactly. Got it. Exactly. Right. The second thing I would point out is that I am prepared to provide you with copies of deeds that for an existing board member on the association that shows the, the Shore Acres Land Company conveyed a specific deeded easement right over all of Surfside Avenue and that that a pertinent right to their lot number 38 has carried on down through to the current owners. And that is the case appears to be the case, not having done a full title search on all of the lots out there, but it appears to be the case with virtually every lot I looked at, that whatever easement rights were deeded by the Shore Acres Land Company, I've never seen anything that releases those back to the Shore Acres Land Company or to anyone else. So that tells me 
I can establish standing among members of the association. Are there any members of the association present here tonight um, that use that area? Yes, I believe so. So that being said, I'm not sure how the board wants to proceed on the standing issue. I did agree with Mr. Schumadine that if he wanted to argue that, this might be an appropriate place to break and have him present his case. But otherwise, I'm prepared just to go forward. I think it would be beneficial. I'm just one person to move on to the standing issue from the, the uh, opposing side at this point. Yeah, I seem to recall this is where we stumbled last time, or you know, we had a pretty hefty debate on. So I think you know, only if we can get beyond the standing issue do we move to the other areas of the, the argument. So I, I, I would agree with Chris. So we want to have Livingston's camp. Come on up, please. Let's begin with the deeds. I actually don't think the deeds are really all that relevant, but he's brought them up and he's misrepresented what I say to a degree, so I thought I might want to clarify that. In, in, uh, just as an initial matter, uh, do you dispute that they're standing here? Oh, yes, there is no standing okay. here. Go on. All right. I think that. I just want think to make sure that. Crystal we, clear there is, there is no standing. dispute here. that we're spending our time discussing. There certainly is a, a dispute here. Uh, as far as the deed is concerned, let's start with the 1991 deed. Uh, we actually have not been challenging the validity of that. I do think, though, there's an open question as to whether it is valid, but that's not really what the Livingston's point in this is. And we, we haven't been challenging that, but since he's raised it, we might as well look at that. The, uh, you know, he's talking about how there's no release of the, the interests, but he's not talking about the statutes that apply. Under Title thir uh, 33 MRSA, section 469-A, subsection 1, a uh, landowner who conveyed property in a subdivision and ostensibly retained title in the roads had to reserve title in those roads, had to file something in the Registry of Deeds within two years after September 29, 1987, if their, their subdivision was recorded prior to that. The Shore Acres Land Company actually did that with reference to a few pieces of, of roads in Shore Acres. I don't believe they did that with reference to Surfside Avenue, which means that whatever title they may have had at one time under statute is now gone. But that's kind of neither here nor there because. And, and, uh, uh, let's just assume what you just said about the statute being what it is true. is accurate. Okay. Uh, what does the statute say then occurs in that instance if they. Title, it, 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 that's, that's that part of the statute is referencing title. Title passes to the center line of the, uh, the way unless you are on a road that is on the outside of the subdivision, as effectively the Livingstons are, then it goes all the way to the end of the subdivision. So under that provision, title to Surfside Avenue goes all the way to the water. So your argument would be that because of the fact that the Shore Acres Land Association did not explicitly make this reservation under this statute, uh, by virtue of that, under the statute, the ownership of the right of of the underlying land in that, that paper street passed completely to the Livingstons. Yes, it, as far as where it is, or the, the fee title did. Um, but as far as 1991 deed is concerned, I think there's an issue because you've got a 1989 deadline for them to reserve title. I don't believe they reserve title. So it's an open question as to whether the Shore Acres Land Company actually had the power to. Isn't there also a Scrivener's Error Savings Statute that comes right after that? I don't recall top of my head. What, what, what do you, what I thought that there was also language in the statute and again I think we should limit the discussion of the I, title issues solely to the standing issue because the board cannot determine. And I'm not asking you to issues. determine title. Um, and so really what you would need to establish on 
this side is whether or not there is standing, and that being not just from a right title and interest perspective, but also from a use and enjoyment perspective. Well, the other part of it is, I just want to talk about the 1991 deed and then stop. This, I've actually drawn out the, the meets and bounds, and this is what the meets and bounds, the green is the meets and bounds of that 1991 deed. The blue is the Livingston's property. So you follow the description on there, it doesn't go across the Livingston's property. So the 1991 deed, in my view, is irrelevant. Can you put that back up again? I, I can. So why do you, are, so you're, you're in effect saying the green is the, the scope of what was conveyed. In 1991. That's based on the text you're saying it only extended to? Yes. You have to follow through the meets and bounds, and I could do that, but I don't think it's really relevant to you and to the extent Tonight. this short circuits this entire discussion, are there members of the association that are present here that are basically on the side of the association, since it sounds like the Livingstons are also members of the association, who are also a butters? To what? This? To the Livingstons property. I'm not sure I understand what you're looking question Looking at is. that I'm map, are, is the owner of the land of one, two, four, or 19 present here? It's over here. Or across the street would be fine too. It, if it's directly across the street. So, in, in, yeah, in effect, because we have the Murphys who we've uh, had uh, prior appeals from. So, separate, setting aside the, the we're, we're, it seems to me, and again, I'm just one opinion here on the board, that we're going down the route of is there standing by virtue of Surfside Avenue, but to the extent that the association also represents basically the purports to represent a number of people in the community, including direct abutters. Well, that's really where I want to go to next. I mean, I, I'm only raising that issue because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what our point is. Our primary point is that that 1991 deed simply, if you read it, you go through its description, it doesn't cross the Livingston's property ever. So it's basically irrelevant. Then I think the other, the other larger point, excuse me, is actually twofold. And that is really, why should the association have any right to do this? You're talking about abutters. You're talking about people who live next to it. Well, that's wonderful. Maybe they have rights, maybe they don't. But they're not the ones bringing this appeal. The ones bringing this appeal is the association. The association is a legal entity. It has its own rights. It has its own responsibilities. It owns property or it doesn't. When it goes and it sues, it sues based upon its own interests. What the association <coughs> is doing here is the equivalent of me going to my neighbor and saying, God, you know, that person's house over there, it really, really messes you up your, your view, doesn't it? Tell you what, I'll sue on your behalf. And the neighbor, my neighbor sits at home, and I go and I try to stand in my neighbor's shoes and say, I have standing because <coughs> the neighbor has standing. It doesn't work that way. The association has to sue on its own rights only. And if you look at the 1991 deed, and if you look at all of these supposed transfers, supposed rights that may or may not exist, none of them flow to the Shore Acres Improvement Association. None of them. It has no rights at all in these properties. So to, to, to attempt to summarize your argument, even the, the release deed from the Shore Acres Land Company went dealt specifically with the land owners, not the association itself. Right. So it doesn't go to the association. The question then becomes, okay, I, I see your argument. So how, how, what interest of the association is impacted by this decision? And I don't think any, any so. is. The association it exists as its own entity. It, it, it's trying to, and this is, the, this is the really odd thing about this whole dispute. The Livingstons, are members of the association. They're members of the association. They pay dues to the association. The association has no dog in this fight because it doesn't have any rights in this fight. Well, I assume the association took a vote of some sort to decide to bring the suit. Uh, it did so. If it did so, it did so without notifying the Livingstons. OK. 
Okay. <laughs> no it, it is I'm now fine. engaging and using its money to take sides in what is essentially a private dispute between private landowners. Some landowners and shoreacres think that they have a right over the Livingston's property. Livingston's disagree with that. So that is a private dispute between private individuals, many of whom, though not all, are members of the association. And here is the association coming in and using this money to intervene in a fight between two, two, two of its members, or more, more of its members. It's basically taking sides in what's a private dispute. And then the last thing, which I only discovered recently, Although the Shore Acres Improvement Association is, in fact, a legal entity, it has been administratively dissolved. Under the statute, the only thing an administratively dissolved association or corporation can do is anything necessary to wind up its affairs. Have you given a copy of this to I the did. association? I did. Just gave it. Yeah. This has nothing to do with winding up their affairs. They can't take this action. They can't file this appeal. They have no ability to under the, under the statute. But furthermore, even if they could, they have no right that they are protecting here. They are protecting the rights of third parties, who may be also be their members, but they're third parties. They are not the association's rights. They're trying to step into a fight, trying to take sides between its members, and they really sh can't do that. They don't have standing to do that. That's Isn't the relatively simple cure for that to have um, named members, such as the member who signed on behalf of the association, be listed? At, I mean, certainly this is not court. It's a relatively easy cure. I would think that they, I would say that they've missed their timeline for that. And then what they should have done is that instead of trying to use association funds for that purpose, they should have assembled the members who want to really do that and filed it, having those members Step in. I don't see why the members get to, to step in the shoes and basically substitute, effectively substitute plaintiffs in this action. Uh, we've already come down the road. We've already prepared. Uh, Mr. Bryant is not representing those individuals. He's representing the association. Uh, I mean, it sounds simple when you say it like that. I, do, I don't think it is. And I think that, that really actually points to the issue here is that the association is a thing. It's an event, it's, it's, it's apparently a person according to the Supreme Court. And so it needs to represent its own interests, not its interests of its In members. my experience, it happens on occasion that the person that pays you is not necessarily the person that you're representing. I understand that as well. But nonetheless, uh, the association is the one who is the named, plaint the named uh, uh, appellant here. And they need, the association's rights are the ones that need to be protected here. And that none of the articulated arguments here even go to the association. And I, again, am just one opinion on the board. But at this point, I think it would benefit to hear the argument from the association then to the extent the town attorney is prepared to address any of these issues which are a little afield from what at least I was expecting tonight. Um, that would be beneficial as well. Certainly. <clears throat> I would point out a few things. One is that I became aware that the association had failed to file its annual report, which is not an uncommon occurrence in nonprofit associations, especially uh, in property associations such as this. And my understanding is that the um, filings necessary to, make the, uh, to get the association back in good standing, including a new annual report and a change of the corporate clerk, I believe were filed last week. I'm not certain of that because I didn't do it. I provided the paperwork to the secretary of the association and told her you need to get this done so you can remain in good standing. So I actually believe the association is quite likely in good standing. And the way that works with the main secretary of state is that you file those things online, they get put in a, in a pile, and seven days or ten days later it finally shows up on the website of the secretary of state as uh, a, an entity in good standing. 
and it is effective as of the date that those filings were made. But that would have been after September, September 25th, right? Which is the date of the appeal that was filed. Uh, yes, yes, it would have been recent. But again, I can't represent you that that's actually the case. I believe it to be the case based upon my discussions with the current secretary of the association. Do we have to tell counsel? <laughs> So the second thing I would point out has to do with the representative nature of the association. This is not like one neighbor asking the other neighbor to go stand in their shoes and sue somebody. The association exists for a purpose, and that purpose is for the general good of its members with respect to improvements within the Shore Acres subdivision. The association membership, certainly a majority of those members who authorized this action at a, me at a meeting in which there was a quorum, um, believes they have rights in Surfside Avenue here and believe that it's for the betterment of the entire association membership, even if one or two or a dozen members may disagree with that action, to pursue uh, the appeal to make certain that the Surfside Avenue right-of-way and the easement rights of the owners within Surfside, uh, excuse me, within Shore Acres subdivision are protected so I think that this is not like the example that Mr. Schumadine tried to present to you of just having a shill come up here and act on behalf of a neighbor who really has no standing. There is a relationship between the members and the association. And that membership relationship is such that the entity acts for the benefit of the general good of its members. Did any of the members actually formally execute an assignment of claims to this association to bring this on their behalf? The I'm not sure that there was a claim. written assignment of any rights because I No, no, believe... not, not a, an assignment of a claim. Did, they, did any of the members execute an assignment of claims to the association to bring this on their behalf? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. I can point out that the application itself was signed by a member who happens to hold easement rights. And who is the Can you of the speak to that issue specifically, whether um, to the extent it's possible for an individual member to essentially be a named party, um, even where the, where the appeal was signed by that person and brought in the name of the association? Because <coughs> frankly, I find um, the association somewhat confusing, first with regard to standing and second with regard to these other issues. So I guess what I'm looking, what I'm asking is can this issue of whether the association did or did not exist at the time that this appeal was filed and secondly whether the association itself does or does not have standing to the extent it flows through to individual named members such that this is not an issue. Yes, I think I can address that. If you look at how the courts treat the issues of standing, I think as it was discussed in an earlier meeting that I wasn't present at, but which I viewed on videotape, it is an extremely low bar. And it's my position not only that the association has standing and has rights to pursue any aspect of the permit that it wishes to challenge here, regardless of the specific um, complaints alleged in the uh, appeal that was filed with you. It's my position, and I think Mr. Schumadine, I hope Mr. Schumadine would agree, that any person who stood up at this hearing during the public portion of this hearing and participated in any way in this hearing would then have standing to further pursue the appeal. So that if this, uh, if this board just denied the appeal, and a member of the public had gotten up and say, I support what the association says, and I think that the original permit should have been overturned, that if then the appeal was denied, any one of those parties could go to Superior Court and say, I participated at a lower level, I had an interest, I've got enough standing, I can pursue that appeal. So your position is that any commenting entity is a party to, that has rights to appeal? No, I'm saying that any person who participates and shows a very, very low uh, level of interest in the subject matter. Wouldn't they have had to have filed an appeal in order to have, to the ZBA, in order to have rights to appeal a ZBA decision? Not necessarily, no. I don't think that's so. 
I think that if, that if an ab another abutter stands up at this hearing and testifies to you about the issues that are raised on the appeal, that that abutter has standing in connection with that denial, and that they um, should be able to pursue those claims in court. I think at this point, to the extent the town attorney is prepared to address any of this, we've got a number of balls in the air that... Oh, I'd love to hear back and forth from each of you afterward, but okay. And the only, only thing I want to say as far as that last point is concerned is that really what was just discussed is a confusion of the standing parameters. Well, we're not, he, um, Attorney Bryant was just talking about the standing of someone to appeal from this decision. So he's talking about when, when someone would have standing to file an action in Superior Court. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the, who has standing to file the original appeal, which is what gets us here in the first place. That, that wasn't lost on me. Okay, well, I just wanted to make sure that, that was there. The rest of the board, please. Yeah. I'd be happy to address any questions you have. <laughs> Can you speak to the issue that I had, the question that I had asked earlier? And I guess my question, to put it completely bluntly, is whether it is possible for us to say, look, this appeal, you know, if I'm looking at the two appeal documents which were signed by Elizabeth Saraj, Savage, Sir, um, Dash Secretary, Secretary of Shore Acres Improvement Association on behalf of board members of the Shore Acres Improvement Association. And I guess my question is, does that mean that that individual could not be a named party to the appeal along with the Shore Acres Improvement Association such that to the extent that individual has standing, it cures the issue with regard to the association? And to take it one further step to the extent that she did it with the permission of the board members, does this in a, can she sign the application on behalf of the board members such that the board members themselves also then are included? Okay, well, I think there may be two different issues going on. Um, I think um, your question is whether or not um, there's some mechanism that would allow, to the extent there are people who are part of this association, to be substituted for the, in this case, the titular party, which is Shore Acres Association. Um, I'm not familiar about whether that is or is not an appropriate step for a zoning board to take. In other words, whether as part of its regular process of de novo review, it could allow substitution in that regard. Um, I, I would the one thing that has not been mentioned, and I'm not sure whether it's appropriate for me to introduce this or not, but if that were a situation where a request was made, um, it may be that um, members of the association, individual members of the association, have already brought an appeal with regard to this particular permit. I don't know whether the Murphys fit that description or not. And then the question might arguably be whether or not there's some kind of preclusive effect in bringing multiple appeals from people who are all similarly situated. Again, that's not an issue that I've researched, so I don't know whether that would be a problem or not uh, in terms of precluding the appeal. It wouldn't be a standing issue at that point. For example, to the extent that the Murphys were one of the, on behalf of board members of the Shore Acres Improvement Association, are, are, are they board members? Okay, so. are, are you board members, yeah? at the time the appeal was filed? Okay. And I, and I think the question you were asking is whether or not what the action we were taking was authorized on behalf of this entity, which is the association. And I have no reason to think that it's not the representation is, is that they're authorized to take the action on behalf of, behalf of the entity. I think the question that's being raised is what significance does that have if the entity itself doesn't have ownership interest in an abutting lot such that the usual analysis of what standing uh, should be applied for abutters, whether or not that pertains. Um, in, in my view, I don't know whether the substitution can occur. If it can occur, I don't know whether this issue of um, effect effectively res judicata would pre preclude that individual who's substituted to go forward um, to prosecute the appeal. Uh, 
I do believe that there, there is a, a legitimate issue to be raised with regard to whether the appellant in this situation um, has sufficient interest in and of itself to prosecute an appeal, particularly if the standing question is going to be evaluated based on whether somebody's an abutter or not. Because obviously if, if they don't own property abutting, then it's, it's arguably a different standard that would apply for, for standing. It's a higher threshold. And I understand that a threshold decision that we have to reach in every instance is whether the appellant has standing. Um, at least for me, this is a very thorny, confusing issue in this particular instance. There's a number of arguments being raised where it's unclear what the actual legal standards are, um, they, the statutes that govern this particular instance. Um, can we move on to the substance of the appeal without first determining standing in this issue instance? Or do we have to reach standing first? Well, um, the issue becomes whether or not you have the ability to, to render a, a decision if, if the party filing the appeal does not have standing. So it, it arguably what you're dealing with is a situation where you enter a, a voidable decision. Um, it may not be void on its face until it's established whether or not the standing exists, but it would be voidable because you wouldn't have the ability to render what is an effective advisory an opinion on a question like that without appropriate standing. And, and, and unfortunately, I, I, I wasn't privy to all of the arguments that were going to be made concerning the status of an entity. Completely understandable. I did not anticipate right. any of these arguments either. So. so I can't tell you off the top of my head whether or not, in fact, there is a, a legitimate argument to make that an association of members who um, are organized through a board, acting through a board, can bring an appeal essentially by wearing the mantle of members who may be affected as abutters. And, I mean, isn't, isn't this is a legal issue? I mean, I guess what I'm, uh, the, what I'm battling, I don't, I don't know how we can make a decision on this tonight without further, I, I mean, I don't know the law. You know, you don't know the law sitting here today. So how do we get past that? I, 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 I mean, I don't know if we want to discuss Basically, amongst the board. It sounds like the parties disagree as to the applicable law and its implications here. Uh, town Council has not had enough time to go and research the issue as of yet to provide us independent guidance. So it seems like we're left with a situation where we don't know what the applicable law is that we have to apply here in order to determine if they're standing. At least that's my view at this point. Uh, Chris? How about the question of uh, the uh, entity's charter being uh, dissolved because of the non-filing? Well, that's Which override is just another other. wrinkle here. <laughs> Wouldn't that override this? No one's presented any evidence that I've seen yet that this entity is an entity that's a viable entity at this time. We, we if it's, if, I mean, they can say they filed something, but here we are now and no one can... I haven't seen anything that says that this organization is back up and running. There's nothing that can be shown. I mean, he said he may have done it last week or a week before, but that's nothing. You know, there's no receipt from the, from the state. And it would be after the date of the appeal. Yeah. Right. So even if you right. cure after the fact right. for the association, the association did not exist. The parties agree that the association did not legally exist as of the date of the appeal. Which, carry, which could be dispositive, but it's operating under the assumption that a, um, a entity that's been instructed to wrap up administratively cannot bring suit. And I don't know if they can or not. And I don't know if we've received any legal advice one way or the other as to whether they can. Yeah, uh, uh, my, my uh, understanding of that is limited to what's been presented and represented, and I can't so independently verify without being able to check. So if, it's a, if it says not carry, acti carry on activities in the state of Maine, that, I don't know, that seems fair. You only go by the, I'm sorry to interrupt. You only go by the document. I mean, here's the document. There's no subsequent document. Well, what does this document tell you? It tells that the corporation no longer has standing. Where does it say it's that? been dissolved. Well, it's been dissolved. But it nowhere says they no longer have standing. Say that again? Nowhere in this document does it say they no longer have standing. No, it says it's been standing, administratively dissolved. No, I added that to it. Well, the association, I mean, hasn't presented any evidence that itself has standing independent of the members. Regardless, the it isn't an abutting up. property owner. It hasn't indicated that it, the easement flows to the association. And there has been no evidence regarding 
individual members' use and enjoyment of that area. So the argument is that it's the burden lies on the association to show that they have standing and no such showing has been made, but that, but the association has basically made an argument that they've paid this. I, we, we don't know if it's, <laughs> at least I don't know one way or the other whether it retroactively then brings back the association to life such that it's as if it was never administratively You know, my take on this would be that the two members that were here last time and presented, um, Mr. Mora and Ms. and I'm sorry I'm mispronouncing the, the last name of the woman who is the secretary. Is she, even, is she present here today? Yeah, so she's even present um, today. So. Can you say your last name for me? Sarage. Sarage. Is that correct? Yes. Um, that those two individuals would, because they participated or executed the appeal would have some different um, status than the association, but I haven't heard any other information other than my own kind of sense of that. So I guess if the burden is on the association or the individual signing on behalf of the association to show that they have standing, if they come in and say, yes, we have standing, and the other side says, no, you don't, and it's an argument legally what they're saying, the status is, it seems to me that it's incumbent upon the board to determine what the, the legal standard is by way of the town attorney before we reach a conclusion. We can't just say, well, you haven't proven to me what the law is. I mean, that, that's my view at least. But I would look to the, those parties to clarify that issue as well. I would agree with that. Uh, let me, I'm just going to say two things, and then I'll step aside, and you can hear additional argument. Um, just because I can't state definitively one way or the other this particular question, it may be that it's never been litigated before in, in terms of a decision, so there may not be much edification there. But the parties themselves through counsel have urged what they their view of the law, and you certainly can rely upon that to, you think you, to the extent you think it's an accurate representation of what the law is. Um, again, there may not be some kind of independent verification that, in fact, they are they're correct. You have to go based upon more first principles. And that brings me to my second point, which is, under normal circumstances, persons can, can be represented by others at an appeals board, but generally a re an appellant is required to have the interest. And so that may be a first principle that you can apply to some of the arguments you've heard to be able to make your decision in this regard, even if I can't give you the, the chapter and verse as to this particular issue. If there's no other questions, I'll just step aside. Uh, Mr. Mr. Wall, what, I do have one further question. Just to, to, the, to the issue of whether if you file all your annual reports, whether, whether essentially the, the corporation administratively continues from the point of when it was dissolved forward or it's continuing from the point it was reinstated forward. Um, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Um, I, I do believe that from a corporate standpoint, um, a corporate board can go back and ratify actions taken during a period of suspension and thereby cure any problems that exist from the, from the perspective of the entity. But the answer, the question I don't know the answer to is whether the state would acknowledge particular actions taken during that interim period as being valid or invalid. And, and Mr. Bryant, just to follow up, I guess, on that point, has has the board of the Shore Acres Improvement Association ratified those annual reports? Do you know? Um, I, I haven't seen the annual reports that were filed. <clears throat> Probably it was the case that they, there, there's a couple ways to do it, but essentially what you can do is file a bunch of back annual reports or the Secretary of State in other instances that I've known has said, no, 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 just file the last one and your current one and we're good. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really a matter of whether you pay Five dollars or twenty-five dollars for, in terms of cumulative filing fees, it's it happens a lot with nonprofits. Um, I, I would point out a couple things. One is that this association has continued to meet. Its board has continued to meet. Its members have continued to meet. They've continued to, to act, regardless of what the Secretary of State says about their corporate status. So, if it is indeed the case that their um, that they had no corporate status as a separate independent corporate entity from the Secretary of State, they continue to act as an unincorporated association on behalf of their members, using the same bylaws, the same rules of order, 
with the same purposes for the benefit of the membership. Do you know legally if an unincorporated association can file suit? Or cannot I, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that an unincorporated association can do just about anything. And I should note that I should have said, can an unincorporated association file an appeal to a zoning board of appeals? Yes. <laughs> Which is I would argue yes. <laughs> okay. And and the second thing I would point out, excuse me. Regardless of the um, association issues um, and their current status or non-status, can you speak to two issues? One, what, how standing flows to the association itself, and second, how, can you address what interests those two specific members have as it pertains to standing, the two members being um, Ms. Siraj and Mr. Mora? Sure. I think I articulated earlier how standing flows to the association, and that is the association acts as an agent, in my view, for its members. Now, whether that is as a corporate agent under its bylaws as a separate independent corporate agency, or whether it acts as a, an unincorporated association, which may be the case, um, its agents have, a, have collective, excuse me, its members have collective interests which they have voluntarily joined in this association to promote. <coughs> and in this instance, the membership with a quorum authorized the action. The board itself carried out that membership uh, authorized action and filed the appeal for the benefit of their members as a whole, including specific members who have deeded rights, and other members who have, uh, who have incipient rights, implied rights. Um, so my take on this is that what this board really needs to step back and do is think about what are we doing here in the first place. We're here because there is what appears to be a significant violation of the zoning ordinance, including the shoreland zoning ordinance. And in making your consideration for how you should accept uh, one level of standing or another level of standing, you ought to be looking at the big picture as to why you're here in the first place. And perhaps you can give me some, uh, your arguments on this. Uh, from my point of view, the bar to meet standing is extremely, extremely low. But the problem I'm facing here is the fact that these, the appeal is brought by an association, not on behalf of any actual landowner in the town, um, or even a, a technically a, a resident of the town. So, which is why I, the, the, the position or the, the argument that was uh, raised as to what about these two individual named uh, individuals in, in the appeal, Mr. Mora and Ms. Uh, again, I'm going to butcher your last name, I apologize, Servash. Uh, where, where are their properties? Can you identify where their properties are? I'll let them identify where their properties are. And I think that's a, I mean, that, to put a finer point on that question, what is the particularized injury to either the association itself or those two individuals? For their members. I would point out one further thing is that if you read the appeal form itself, Dr. Serge signed that, <clears throat> excuse me, on behalf of board members of the Shore Acres uh, Improvement Association. So not just Dr. Serge and Mr. Mora, who is the president, but I would, I would argue that every other board member who has um, uh, could serve as a substitute or a proxy. And so do any of those board members have property that lie on, say, Pilot Point Road or within like four or five properties of the property at issue? Or do they use that area on the property themselves personally? And I'm going to ask my clients. <laughs> Yeah. It's uh, a little could, confusing. Could, I'm sorry, because could, of our, my name is Barbara Freeman. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Barbara Freeman, 22 Pilot Point Road. Our board at the annual meeting was reelected, and I am no longer a board member, but I was at the time of that meeting when the vote was taken by the community to pursue action on this matter. So, A, there was a, you're, you're telling us that there was a vote taken by the board to pursue the appeal? 
there was a vote taken by the board to pursue the appeal. There was also a vote taken on the part of the membership at this annual meeting. In, uh, the map we have doesn't show the street numbers. Can you tell us where 29 Pilot Point is? Yes. Guys? I live diagonally. In other words, 22. Hmm. I'm one house away from being directly across from the Livingston property. I am across from one of their adjacent properties. Um, Do you use the area of Surfside? That's I have been wanting to use the area of Surfside since I've moved into this community and asked at regular intervals about my rights to it. I'm delighted to find that very likely my rights are not something that can be just talked away but in fact continue to exist. I personally have informally walked down behind those properties but I'm not a regular walker across what will now be the Livingston's backyard, no. Any other questions the board has of me? Because I think that that statement gets us over the hump in terms of meeting the bar of, uh, of standing. Assuming that we can somehow say that the association's, the interest of the individual board members of the association can somehow be trans uh, conveyed over to the association itself for purposes of finding standing. Yes. Uh, one of the issues it, that still. The, the uh, question is sort of a substitution issue. And again, my point is that. There is clearly an issue here which affects individuals who have interests adjacent or nearly adjacent to the property. And those individuals clearly have a problem with this permit. They acted through their association, which was either a corporation or an unincorporated association, um, whose purpose is to protect the rights of its members, including those individuals who have, would have standing had they individually signed the complaint. In, do you have a copy of the bylaws yes, no. of this association? Uh, I was just given one tonight. And I'm not sure I have it quite handy, but. In part of the appeal notes in a letter, <coughs> March 21st, 1992, there's a Shore Acres Improvement Association letter where it states that the association itself worked in conjunction with the Ocean View Associates in order to come up with this release deed. So the association played a role in that a deed? Absolutely. I was not even involved. Though, even obviously. though the, the association itself did not obtain any rights by virtue of the release deed, they at least were actively involved in uh, result, uh, the results that we have here of a release deed existing. I know that to be the case. I was not involved in that transaction, but I've had uh, information from parties involved, including council involved, that made clear the association acted on behalf of its members and in negotiating the, with Shore Acres Land Company. The, the, the cost associated with filing this release deed, was that uh, a cost that was covered by the association? I have no idea. Uh, can I ask a couple questions of the board? Um, it's not entirely clear to me whether we're going to get beyond the standing issue um, without some clarification on some legal issues that we've that, that you and Joanna have raised, I mean that have been raised tonight I mean <laughs> and I you know I'm, I'm happy to no I'm not happy to keep belaboring <laughs> this <laughs> but but I think that you know we if we if we if we need uh, you know we have uh, we can go one of two directions we, we can we can listen to the we can we can listen to the merits of of the remaining appeal um, recognizing that you know we can get that on the record re recognizing <coughs> we're not beyond the standing issue and therefore we cannot render a decision I don't think or we table this and we need to get clarification from council between now and the next meeting as to whether the association has the legal standing to bring the appeal or not. And it, it, the, right? The pro I, I completely agree with everything you said. Uh, the problem I have, and I don't see any solutions, so I think that might be the route we have to go, is um, we've been dragging these parties 
back I, over and I know. over and everyone is entitled to getting this resolved. And it, I, I mean, I, yeah. my, my view is we should probably take a vote on standing and see if we can resolve it now. If we can't resolve it now, then we should proceed and at least take the evidence on the substantive underlying issue, unless there's a reason we can't do that for some reason, but might as well take the underlying substantive issues, take the evidence, and then we'll at least have the record. So once we make the standing determination, if we can't today, then the substantive decision, we won't need to then bring everybody back here. Well, we'll need to bring them back. It'll just hopefully be a quick meeting. Correct. Can we um, proceed like that, but also ask not necessarily that our attorney address the standing issue, but that the appellants whose burden it is to establish standing submit some additional documents such as affidavits or other items that would address the standing issue sufficiently? I'm happy to, to do that if the, that's the board's desire. Okay, so let's. Uh, I, I think can I make a comment. Uh, sure. I, I think we should proceed. Uh, to leave it to the attorneys to research more, it'll just come back the same. Again, they're attorneys. When you get different uh, points of view. <laughs> I've heard enough. I think you know the standing issue. Him, he'll come back and he'll show a document that they did indeed pay the money, like fifty dollars. Yeah, you know? I don't think the issue. Yeah. No, but wait, wait a minute. It, it, yes, to me it does because of the standing whether or not they had standing to indeed file because they were uh, no longer a corporation or at least, you know, the verbiage that I read here. I, I think we should try to go as far as we can and see if we can make a decision. So, uh, uh, if you can, can you explain to me how you think we have enough information to make a decision? What, what information are, would you rely on? I'm relying on the question of the standing. So, uh, yeah, what, what information do we have that's sufficient? Well, it would be coming out now, the, the, the balance of what the appeal is based on. Yeah, so I'm asking you, um, from my perspective, we lack the necessary uh, knowledge to make a determination on standing at the present moment. In what so, area? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I don't know, A, first off, I don't know the, how accurate this is. This is old. I don't know if there's been anything since then. I don't know. Uh, if they, they say they filed paperwork. I don't know what the implication of filing the fees and the paperwork are. For all I know, it's retroactive, such that this becomes null and void. We, I'm lacking all of that information. Also, there's the possibility that a number of the board members, including ones who signed, also have an interest such that potentially there's a possibility that by virtue of them being named on this application, they can step in or the association, as an, even as an unincorporated association, can represent them on the appeal. We, I, I don't know the answer to that. It's an issue that's been raised, and that's something that I assume the attorneys could address. So with those questions outstanding, I can't reach a conclusion. But if you can explain to me a way that I can reach okay. a conclusion. Well, first of all, I think it's a stretch to take board members and insert them instead of the, the association. But, but uh, what's your basis for reaching that decision? Common sense. But I mean, what you're saying now is, is that the appeal will not be in the name of the association. The question is, uh, we'll what's, what's the governing the law and not common sense? That's, I mean, to me, it's common sense. But that's no. not what we apply, so go on. Well, I don't know. You know <laughs> well, <laughs> well, 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 to say that the law is not common. Yeah, but we have, we have zoning board of appeal. Me, personally. Yes, we do have a certain latitude. We have zoning board of appeal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, one point you brought up I didn't notice, that this is dated September 2007. Now, when did you when did you reapply? Not reapply. When did you send your money in to try to get this back uh, in good standing? Again, I, I'm not certain, but I I discussed it last week, so my understanding is it went in. I, again, I don't know. L let me I tell let you me all that I do. this, if I, if I could, um, uh, Josh. I, I think I, I think you you've taken the proper path here, and uh, I guess my suggestion would be. It, uh, whether uh, counsel for the Livingstons has anything further to say. I'm sorry, before I go there. Um, Attorney Brian, I don't know if you have anything further to say on the, on the standing issue. Um, if, if you don't, um, counsel, if, if you have anything further, we'll hear it. And then I think we'll, we'll, take, a, we'll take a vote one way or the other as to whether you know, we can get beyond the standing issue or just decide we can't. Absent that, then I think we're going to take evidence on, on the balance of the appeal. Does that sound like a workable game plan? I think it, so. It, 
Perhaps the town council could advise us on this, but is it possible for us to take a vote where we reach the merits and say we reach the merits solely uh, assuming that they're standing in this actual vote remains contingent on us determining whether standing exists because to the extent that we determine that the appeal has no merit this standing issue becomes kind of null and void I'll, I'll go along except with that. for that it's a huge waste of time yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm against that I, I think we we make a decision on the standing before we continue to hear anything else I'm probably gonna be the dis the minority on that but I mean they either can be here or you can't be here period I mean but I until think that, and I understand they're here. I know this has been dragging on. It's not my argument to make. I'm not the one that filed the appeal. We're here to make a decision. If they have standing, great, push forward. If they don't, then they don't. And if we can't make that decision now, we can't make that decision now. But to hear evidence on a whole bunch of other stuff when maybe we shouldn't even be hearing it, if they don't have standing, I just, I don't, I don't see it. And to that end, you know, we have spent the last two meetings talking about the standing issue, and it certainly is the appellant's burden <coughs> to establish standing. And to the extent we don't feel like we have sufficient evidence to establish standing, I mean, that well, is, what is determinative that, what does that in say some way. I think we're struggling to some degree with um, a question that hasn't been addressed by the appellant and wanting to allow more time to address it, but at the same time um, feeling like maybe we should have that evidence in front of us already. I would completely agree with that if it were if we had received this prior to the hearing. Oh, this was handed to us at the hearing. Um, I don't know how far ahead of time. I guess how were the appellants aware of this issue? I was aware from Mr. Schumadine. A phone call was that this afternoon, John? I think. Well, they had to refile. Saying that, saying back. that he would challenge standing. I was not aware of this particular I mean, issue that he was going to raise. They, did it. they just did it. Got it. So of course they knew. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean there's, there's no, there is no question that they filed the paperwork after the appeal period, after the, the September 25th. I mean, by, having everybody say differently. So that's, so there's no, despite the fact it's dated 07. So I, I, I'm on the fence as to whether they're standing at this point, but it sounds like there may actually be a majority that there's not. But um, we would have to take a vote. Uh, do we want to hear from town council before we do that? Do you have any? Do you do you have anything further to add to the standing <laughs> argument? <laughs> I, I just just want to add a couple of things. You know, I don't think they have standing. I think you do need to look to the association and what, whether it has standing or not. I think the point of the document that I handed you today, for one thing, I only found out about it very recently. I found out about it yesterday. I didn't know about it before. I looked at it this morning, or maybe it was before lunch. They remain to be in, not in good standing. Uh, so as far as I'm aware they haven't cured that, uh, and until they can prove that they've cured it, I think that's, that's an important issue. I think, though, that that's kind of a minor side issue, because I think the real focus of the decision here is not whether they've been administratively dissolved or not, but whether the association itself has standing itself. And with respect to that, I, wanna, I, I think there are two points that I want to make about that. Can, in your opinion, can an unincorporated association bring suit on behalf of its members? I think it needs to name the, the members and, and have the members be, be named and say it's, I don't think they can. I don't think, I think, in any way, this is, I, I think it's, an, it's an, a corporation. It's not in good standing, but it's a corporation. It exists as an entity. So I think the question really is, doesn't apply here. I think there's an issue under the administrative dissolving whether it can actually do anything at this time. But I also think that's kind of side, a side issue. I think it's, it's important because they could have cured this. They didn't. But the real important issue, though, and the focus that I really like the board to, to, to get on is this issue of the association itself and what harm has it shown <coughs> to itself and its interests. <coughs> but it's you that it's shown none because they don't have any interests. And I think that there, there are a couple of other points that I wanted to make. I heard talk about the collective interests of the membership. 
There's no such thing. There are a lot of individuals who have individual rights, potentially, in some portions of this shore acre subdivision. And I'm not by suggesting that any of those rights go across the Livingston's property, because I'm not sure that many of them do. And I'm, I think, in fact, I think most, most of what's been alleged is, is, doesn't even apply. But that's really not the point. If person A in the association has an easement across a piece of property, that is an easement for that person. If person B has the same easement, or, or an easement across the same property, that's an individual easement. Just because they have an easement across the same property doesn't make that a collective right of the two of them. Because it is possible to find that one person has abandoned their right and the other person has not. All of these rights are individual to the person. They exist individually. They do not exist in collective. You could easily find that 99% of the Shore Acres Improvement Association's membership doesn't have any rights. But that doesn't affect the 1% who might. All of the rights rise and fall on their own. So they can't be collectively aggregated together by the association unless they've gotten some assignment of claim or something, which they haven't. So the association does not stand in the shoes of its members. It cannot go and enforce rights that its members have, but the association does not have. It has to show, it has to prove that it has rights that it is enforcing here. Related to that, we object strongly to any attempt to substitute parties in this action. The association filed the action, or the, the, the appeal, not action, the appeal. The association is the one who did it. The people who signed it signed it as, member, as, uh, as officers of the association, not in their individual capacity. It is the association itself that's the sole focus of decision here. But moreover, if it is individuals, then I think we ought to start talking about race judicata and get into that argument. Because frankly, we've already done this entire argument once before. We're going to go through the same arguments with exactly the same evidence and exactly the same arguments again if you find that there is standing. And I think that, that if we're going to talk, to, talk about individuals, then we've got to start talking about race judicata. Although but, not to go into the, the subject of the appeal too much, but I think this is a slightly different appeal. And there were issues previously with one of the appeals as to timeliness, so we didn't go into the substance of it. Yeah, that was a different permit. The timeliness issue was to the, to the house Very true. Very true. and the deck permit. Mm -hmm. This permit is the patio permit, which was heard on the merits of the last hearing and resolved on the merits in the last hearing. Very true. Very true. And I don't want to get into the merits either, but yep. I don't think that they're standing, so I'd ask that you find that there is not. Attorney Bryant. Well, I'd suggest that it's just ignoring reality to suggest that there aren't common and collective rights amongst a group of people. If you've got 99% of the people in a subdivision who think, gee, it would be a great idea if all these various individual rights we have get enforced against somebody who's attempting <clears throat> to violate those rights, and instead of every one of them going down and signing the, the complaint or the appeal of a permit, instead say, gee, the whole reason we have an association is so they can act on behalf of our mutual interests. It's just nonsensical to say that the association doesn't serve a role on behalf of its members. If indeed 99% of the association doesn't have any rights down here, the membership is pretty surely soon going to tell the association, why are you bothering to do this? We have no interest in this. Don't do this. That's the opposite of what we have here. What we have here is testimony presented that there was a membership meeting of the association, that that membership meeting approved pursuing these rights, which the association believes are broadly shared amongst virtually all of its members, whether they are or not is an open question, and the board acted as in their capacity on behalf of the association. Are there now, minutes this, from that meeting? Pardon me? Do you have the minutes from that meeting? Um, I do. Oh, well, uh, apparently I do, although I can't lay my hands on right now. I can look through my voluminous materials and see if I can find them. We do have the representation of the board member who is here about the vote taken by the membership and the vote taken, taken by the board. So that seems to me should be pretty good evidence of what happened there. Is it, just a point of clarification, for, I guess for me, is it, uh, do certain 
members, though, have, if you will, deeded rights within their deeds to the right of way and others in the association do not? I'm certain that that's the case. Mm. We have 80 years of deeds. Sure. The, the Shore Acres Land Company changed the form of the deed, the lang particular language of the deed, uh, regularly throughout those 80 years. So we have instances in which they're extremely broad uh, language granting all rights in specific uh, roads shown on the plan, including Surfside Avenue. We have deeds, on the other hand, there are deeds out there which say you get lot X in Shore Acre subdivision. That don't say anything about easements. And for that particular lot owner in that chain of title, title unless there was a subsequent conveyance by the declarant, they have incipient rights that say, gee, you know, I've got implied rights to, to get from this lot along these roads to the public road, but I can't point to my deed and say, here, I've got a right to travel over those roads. And, and, so, and it, it's across the board. And, and just to take it a step further, how about relative to abutters to the Livingstons, would, would, again, you may or may not know this, whether they have deeded rights to the right of way or just, you know, a deed? My understanding, uh, and this, I cannot swear to this on the Bible, but my understanding is that the conveyances along uh, what is now Pilot Point Road, that most of those conveyances, I believe, included a specific right to go, to go upon both what was then called, I think, Oak Grove Road, it's now Pilot Point Road, and Surfside Avenue. So I think that if you're looking at that section of the uh, subdivision, which is closest to this property, my recollection from scanning and sampling these deeds is that those deeds uh, related to properties that were along Pilot Point Road um, did have specific language that granted them rights within both what is now Pilot Point Road and Surfside Avenue as shown on the plan. Some went even further than that. Some, some deeds went to say in addition to rights along these roads, including naming Surfside Road, there's at least one deed I saw that says, and you get a right to go down to the shore beyond Surfside Road to access the ocean. Um, so like I say, they're all over the board. Uh, but my impression is that the vast, I don't want to say the vast majority, certainly a significant number of the lot owners in Shore Acres have rights over, shore, have deeded rights over Surfside. Are you saying that, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you saying that because some homeowners may have rights that are being affected, that means the association is being affected? I'm saying that the association represents the interest of its members. And you have at least a majority of the voting members who say, I'm interested in pursuing my rights here. And my understanding is that the vast majority of members of the association believe that they do have rights over this area. Obviously, there's a disagreement with the Livingstons of whether that's true or not, but the association membership certainly believes, as evidenced by the vote authorizing pursuit of this appeal, that they have <laughs> rights over the area of Surfside directly adjacent to the Livingstons lot. So if one homeowner who's a member of the association says that they're being harmed, the association's then position is, is there, the association's being harmed as well? No, the association membership and or its board, ultimately, would vote to say, is this an issue which potentially affects more than just this individual? And if it's a point uh, that relates to a number, potentially relates to a number of the members and their interests, then the association is going to get a vote by the members to say, pursue this. So let, let's if see there's if just one isolated individual who's got one issue with a neighbor, I don't think you're going to find the association voting as, voting as a majority of the members or the board acting as a capacity as the, as the, uh, the board for the, for the association, then saying, gee, the association is going to jump into this issue and solve that dispute between those two neighbors. So that's let, not what we have here. Let me see if this summarizes what you just said. So let's set aside who has deeded rights to Surfside. Uh, the one aspect of commonality for all members of the association is they all live in this community. Correct? Correct. And they're, they're due paying members of this as association, correct? All those who are members of the association are, pay their dues, yeah. yes. So we, we have an association that only represents people that live in this area, and this area is a geographic region that all lies within approximately one mile of the lot at, at issue, 
even less. Certainly. And basically, all members are basically saying we have standing because we are, or the board representing the membership is saying we have standing because we have an interest in what's happening on this lot. And there's a number of different arguments coming up as to why they have an interest. Um, a, it sounds like you're saying because they all live in the area. B, because some of them also might have deeded rights of some sort to, to that area. C, some of them may be abutters to the, the lot. It, is this accurate? What, is yes, that accurate plus question? I would add, my understanding is the majority of members, if not unanimous number of members, but I think it's certainly a significant majority. sounds like significant one member majority. We've got one who doesn't, but, saying, but a significant majority of the membership so. believes that they have <laughs> rights along Surfside Avenue. <laughs> That goes back to the question of the 1991 D, but, but nonetheless, you've got a membership that voted to pursue this because they all believe they have a right on Surfside Avenue. But the question of standing is whether those members have an injury and whether the association has an injury. And just because there may or may not be rights is not determinative on that issue. How does the permit that was issued cause a particularized injury to the association or individual members thereof? Because <clears throat> the improvements made by the Livingstons, we contend, violate the shoreland zoning ordinance of this municipality, potentially violate the state ordinances because they affect the area over which these uh, members of the association have rights to pass and repass. And how do they affect that area? They built a retaining wall there, and, and they covered it with fill. How does that injure the fill. easement holders, or Pardon the me? alleged? How does that injure the alleged easement holders? They have made well. I guess two ways. One is that it affects the the, the sloping fill that's been put onto the lot, affects the ability, whether for good or evil, but it certainly affects the ability of those with the right to passage to pass over that land. There are also other improvements that have been made there which, which are subject of a separate appeal, but the point is that actions taken in that area affect the passage. The second thing is, one of the things that make uh, life in Shore Acres a, a, a good thing is that we've protected the environment. And the whole purpose of shoreland zoning is to preserve open space and protect environment and to control the cumulative effects of development within the shoreland area. So would you say that the Shore uh, Acres Association has a particularized <laughs> interest in ensuring the pr uh, preservation of the water body that directly is adjacent to the area they live in? Absolutely. And I think you they have a... That regrading, um, to the extent that the regrading was not permitted, uh, results in an increase in runoff into the water body that creates an injury for the Shore Lakers Association, Shore Acres Association membership. That's among the injuries they suffer. I think there's a I think there's a larger point, which is that when you step back and look at all the things that have happened recently along the shoreline, the, from the association's perspective, the town's ordinance have not been enforced, and. If somebody doesn't step up and force the town to enforce the ordinances, then nobody does and everybody suffers, including particularly all of those who are in the Shore Acres Association who now have their rights over the Surfside uh, <coughs> Avenue impaired by all the various improvements, fills, structures that are placed in that area. Uh, and I think that's wrong. So that's the injury that I think is particularized to residents of Surfside, uh, excuse me, of the Shore Acres Association. Um, and I think that sufficient level of standing, whether it's done as an unincorporated association, whether we determine it's the corporation that does it, or whether, as shown on the application presented to you by the association, by the individual board members, including those who signed uh, and presented at the last uh, hearing, all of the, any one of those areas is enough, is a, any one of those avenues is enough to get you over the bar of standing. Thank you, Attorney Bryant. Sure. Attorney Wall. And we don't have a copy of the bylaws, right? Pardon me? You, you, you couldn't find a copy of the bylaws for the association? Um, or do you have it? I thought I had it here. 
I have a 1989 copy, and I don't know if this is current or not. So. You want to see it verse? Mr. Chair, um, if I may, I was just going to suggest uh, more of a process oriented than trying to respond to anything else unless you have any particular questions. Um, my suggestion would be in order to try and add clarity to the issues you have to address, I would suggest that the, the board's first vote would be whether they, the board has sufficient information to decide the standing issue. And that would be up or down. And if the majority of the board votes that it does, then it can then proceed to vote on that issue up or down. Um, and if the answer is no, then the board could proceed to decide whether it wants to table the issue, the, the appeal, until that issue can be resolved, or whether it wants to proceed and receive evidence and then close the record and then table the matter for resolution of the standing issue so that if it decides it does have standing at the next meeting, it can then proceed to evaluate the evidence based upon the record that already exists and make its determination on the merits. Could you really briefly discuss uh, whose burden it is to make sure that we have enough evidence to decide standing? Well, it's the appellant's responsibility to present sufficient evidence to demonstrate they have standing. I mean, I don't think there's much question about that. What does standing mean? Uh, I mean do you mean that the corporation is, put, is, is okay now because they paid the money? I guess uh, my... Uh, Can you explain what standing I'm sorry, means? yeah. Go ahead. The standing is to establish that the party who's bringing the appeal has a sufficient injury to substantiate a, a, a tribunal, the board, rendering a decision that is not just advisory. It has to be an actual controversy, and the particularized injury ensures that it's not just, it, it's not just somebody coming in off the street saying there's a problem here. There's somebody who has a, a particular injury they can point to to establish that I, I, should be re I should have some redress from the board because of this injury I stand to suffer if it's not corrected. And as, as I think we've discussed, for abutters that standard is very low. It's, it's basically any type of perceptible injury to the interest they're able to articulate is sufficient to generate standing. But they do have to meet a burden of establishing that particularized injury as opposed to the, the general public. Wouldn't it be more important to determine whether or not the, uh, the organization that brought all of this um, did indeed exist? And um, again, I question being able to substitute uh, individual directors or members. Right. Well, I think if, it, if the issue comes down to one of whether or not you can substitute, I, I think that the more prudent course would be to, to table it before making any resolution of the standing issue, because that really goes more to the uh, integrity of the board's process of deciding how it's going to proceed when these type of situations occur, rather than uh, going going out and, and making some determination and then trying and do it over after all the evidence is put in. I think I think at that point it's a process issue that the board has to establish up front. But if it's an issue of whether or not the board has sufficient information, both factual and legal, to establish that this particular party has demonstrated standing to present this appeal, um, then it's, uh, again, it's an issue that the appellant has the burden on, and it's an issue that the board has to feel it has sufficient information about in order to make a, a decision, because that's to articulate why it feels it has stand, the appellant has standing, or why not. Well, I don't want to argue with you, but I don't like the idea of uh, the substitution. I mean, somebody, somebody made a complaint, whatever the issue is, and uh, it was this association. And maybe the association really didn't have the right because it didn't exist. And to the extent that you, you find, I mean, that's, I guess my point is, is that I think the initial step for the board is really to determine whether it has sufficient legal and factual information to make that determination. But I know standing. that now. 
of the letter. And, I don't see another letter. And, and then if the answer is no, then you can decide whether or not you want to take evidence of the merits and then close the record pending a resolution of the standing issue, or whether or not you just want to table it at that point to obtain whatever legal and factual information you request of the parties and of, of counsel for the town to supplement what you already have. I guess I'm ready to make a motion on standing, and I'm perfectly prepared to be in the minority on this. Um, but I guess my sense is that as to the association, um, it does not have that we find that it does not have standing because as of the date that the appeal was filed, it was not <coughs> a legitimate entity. <coughs> and there's, it's their burden to establish that they were a legitimate entity and there's no evidence in the record after two hearings that they were a legitimate entity. And second, that they're not a actual named easement holder um, and they have also have the burden to establish that the association itself suffered particularized injury, that burden has also not been met. The third part of my motion would be to substitute the um, individual board members that were named on the appeal and who appeared before us at the last hearing and at this hearing to demonstrate their particularized injury and given that it is such a low bar for particularized injury, I personally would be comfortable saying that that standard was met with regard to those individually named parties, but not the association. You substitute? You'd allow the substitution? Mm -hmm. So do we want to go with the threshold question first that the town council had proposed, which is do we have sufficient information to reach those decisions? And or that's why I didn't, I didn't go that way because I feel like we do for the association, but maybe we don't for the individuals. Got it. Got it. Understood. Understood. And I, you're, the, where I'm having issues is I don't know what the legal implications are for a at one point incorporated association becoming administratively dissolved such that it's an uh, but I guess your argument would be it's, it's not our burden. it's not our job to figure that out if that's their argument they should have argued it so but within the context of your motion you're essentially saying that that the, that the Shore Acres Improvement Association doesn't have standing yes. to bring the action yes uh, you're, you're, you're the motion would be that, that individual members could substitute. Those individuals that were named in the appeal and that participated in the last hearing and this hearing but and talked have, about, you know. That would have to be a subsequent appeal. I don't know that it would. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that would work procedurally, and I think maybe. I'm pretty sure the Livingstons will very likely, of course, you never know, argue that it has then become untimely. Um, but for the second one, the particularized, particularized injury, from my point of view, I guess, and explain why you think otherwise, um, by virtue of simply living in the neighborhood, they have a particularized injury, of the injury that would be argued, and I'm not saying that the injury actually exists, but if the injury that's argued is there's an adverse impact to the water body, which is the entire point of having the shoreland. I don't think that can be particularized. I think there's I a, that's where a pretty differ. big body of case law out there that says that <laughs> has to be in. Can, can I, I, are we, so we have a motion on the, the, the floor. <laughs> yeah, fair I, enough. I know we have a tendency to then debate the motion. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with the first can, can you, you, was that three different motions? Or yeah, could you, I could, guess I did it as Could you do it in bite-sized morsels, please? Bite size. So the first motion is to, um, I haven't done this a lot. <laughs> to find that the Shore Acres Improvement Association does not have standing because it was not a legitimate entity as of the date of the appeal and because it doesn't have, it's not a named easement holder and therefore they did not, also did not present evidence sufficient to establish um, their interest in the property or that the permit caused particularized injury to the association. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second that one. Okay, so we have a second by Jeff. 
Any further discussion? You know, I, I, I gotta, I gotta say that, from a, I hate to say this word, Chris, from a common sense perspective, <laughs> um, if, if you're sitting here after two and a half meetings and you're debating whether somebody has standing or not, and the appellant ring has the burden of proving standing, and we're still sitting here debating standing, and that tells me they haven't proved they have standing. That's. But this letter just came in, I mean, interrupt you. But didn't this letter just come in today? I'm sorry, go ahead. It, well, it, I, I think that's certainly an element, Barry. I mean, that, that's yeah. on an unimportant element, but I, but I think that there, there's another element to this, which is does, does, does the Shore Acres Improvement Association have, have standing? Do they have the, do they have the, the um, um, you know the 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 the, the deeded the deeded rights, if you will, to 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 bring to bring the action. I mean, certain of their membership, their members may, but and this I think was was part of what was raised as part of I think part B or C of the motion of your initial motion. But um, but I, I think that we're, we're at least I am still not convinced they have standing, and we've had two meetings for them to prove it, and and now. This latest thing on the corporate dissolution, if you will, is, is simply another element of they don't have standing. Okay. So. And I'm still left in the position where I understand your argument is basically this has been going on long enough that they should be on notice that they needed to prove this point, although I'm still left with the question of they, they've come forward and said, no, 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 we have, we have an interest. We are a legitimate entity. We, even if they're not properly incorporated, they still represent a group of individuals who all live right near the, the, the property at interest. And the argument is that the property at interest is violating the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. To me, that, that in and of itself, because of the fact that there's that commonality amongst all of the landowners, that they can say, we have a particularized injury, we all live right near, near this lot, and we are, whether it's true or not, arguing that the ordinance for the shoreland zone has been violated and the ordinance exists for the purpose of protecting the water body and that water body is not being protected so we are experiencing a particularized harm. For me, that, that is enough to show the injury. What I'm left with in the part that I can't really address is whether legally they can come forward with their argument. Well, I think that's, and I think that goes that, to your point that they, ha they had the opportunity, it's their burden, they failed to show it. Um, well, we have a second on this motion. Um, let's put it to a vote. Um, all in favor of uh, the motion? Your motion? Aren't you voting first? Mm -hmm. Are you voting first? I am. Okay, yes. yeah. I <laughs> One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. All opposed? And are we allowed to abstain, <coughs> to abstain for board votes or are we obligated to vote yes, no? I think we're obligated to vote yes, no, but I could be wrong. Attorney Wall? Uh, I'm abstaining to the extent that's construed as a no. I, 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 I'm voting that I lack basically sufficient information to make a decision. Could you say that louder? I, I lack. I feel I lack sufficient information to make a decision at this point, based on what the legal standard is. On this last vote, you mean? On this vote, yes. On the next one, the last one. But at the end of the day, it's, it's four have already voted. Voting. So, right. it's however, my vote is recorded. I lack sufficient okay. information. Well, we have we have four in favor. I, I oppose. Okay. Okay. And one uh, that, that everybody well, recorded as a as a no based on lack of sufficient information to decide that. Okay, so four, two, four, one, four, two. It didn't carry. I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. It, it carried. It carried. It did carry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, with that, um, I believe the administrative uh, appeal of the shore. Shore Acres Improvement Association um, has been denied. 
I had I had had a second motion too about um, the substitution issue. Yes, you mentioned that as one of your morsels earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess I would renew that motion um, or restate that motion that um, we look to the individuals who were present at the last meeting and the present meeting on who were and who were named in the appeal as either board members or specifically Mr. Mora and who presented evidence regarding their specific injury to themselves and um, given the low bar for standing my motion would be that those individuals step into this appeal to move it forward. I'll second the motion just for purposes of providing a second. Okay, so your motion is essentially to allow uh, Mr. Mora as president of the, well not in his, in his, I guess not in his capacity as president of the Shore Acres Improvement Association. And why are we all but butchering your name? Right. Right. Sarage. Uh, uh, Dr. Sarage, uh, to, to basically bring a motion, or not a motion, but, bring, but to, to step into the shoes of the, the Improvement Association. No, I guess my motion is that they, because they were named and <coughs> participated throughout the proceedings, that they were effectively, like when you do a, when you file a legal action on behalf of association, mm -hmm. you often also list named members of that association. And then when you're going through the action, you address all of the issues with regard to the specific named members, such as filing affidavits about their injury, that kind of thing. And I, given that our standards are substantially lower, we're just a local board, we're certainly not a court, I would say that this, their participation and their names on this appeal document is enough for them to get over the hurdle of standing um, as being kind of synonymous with the Shore Acres Improvement Association for the procedural purposes of having timely filed the appeal and for um, standing. Comment? Yeah, uh, I don't yeah. think it's right. I don't think it's legal. Can you explain what basis you have for those views? Can we go over this a little bit before? If it's common sense, it's common I mean, sense. There's a, I mean, there's an applicant, there's an association, a corporation, which filed the appeal. You want to substitute two people. You can't do that. I don't think. I mean, doesn't, doesn't this get, I mean, the issue that town council was raising that to, to kind of now do this w without due consideration puts the board in, a, in an uncomfortable position where we're, we're sort of changing the rules midstream? I don't know if that's the right way to put it. <coughs> sort of, we're, we're sort of, we're, we're, we're trying to craft something to keep this going where I guess it's, that's you not know, my perspective on it is that we're having pretty detailed legal arguments about standing that kind of thing though that's a pretty high technical and legal bar to put on both a citizens board and on individual citizens that have concerns about building permits I mean in the real world, if you've got a concern about a building permit, citing common sense, not that I have any, <laughs> um, you know, you should, if you're injured by something your neighbor is doing, you should be able to come in and have your appeal be heard. And being... It's basically look, we're being hyper-technical as to yes. how the appeal was filled out. Yes. We have a bunch of, we have average citizens who came in and filled out an appeal uh, they listed the association. Uh, there's two different in people individually named here on it. Your point would be that to, to say, oh, whose name is listed on the line appellant name is being hyper te technical. Yes. They it, came, they presented, they've participated, they've said, here's how this impacts me. From a legal and a common sense perspective, it seems fair to me to say that they've gotten over what is supposed to be a pretty low bar. But I mean that, that pretty low bar isn't the 
procedural bar. It's, it's the do you have standing because there's been an injury. It, it, I think it's probably what? also a procedural bar, too. And, I mean, and, there shouldn't be a high procedural bar to find, filing an appeal to the ZBA. And, uh, Attorney, well, the, what was your concern? What's your concern about proceeding if we were to find in favor of that motion? What? Well, uh, my concern is that I can't tell you whether or not it's something that the board has authority to do. Um, because I'm not sure that it's anything that's ever been really contemplated uh, in case law as to the extent of the authority of, of the board to make that kind of substitution. Now, clearly, if you're a court, courts have inherent authority that boards don't necessarily have to be able to uh, adjust parties uh, in order to make sure that the real party in interest is, is appearing. But there are ramifications when you have substitutions, for example, that deal with where the, say, statute of limitations is a question. Um, and there are what they call relation back problems, even within the court system, where they have that sort of inherent authority to adjust the, the parties appearing. So the, the, the thing that I would be uncomfortable about is I can't tell you as I stand here today whether or not the board has that kind of authority and if so what the ramification of that would be for the parties who are, who are here. Um, and, and that's, it's just the fact that I wasn't aware that this was a potential consideration and, and therefore wasn't able to, to do any kind of a preliminary research on, on how to approach it. Um. Attorney Wall, could you just stay there for a second? So, I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, I just, I don't think we can move into the mode of, um, okay, we're going to substitute, substitute. I mean, I just think that's not what the ZBA does. I think we've, we've <coughs> taken a vote that has passed four to two to deny the administrative appeal. I, I don't think that's what the vote was. The vote was that the Shore Acres Improvement Association lacks standing. Okay, but the question enough. is, whose name is on the appeal? And we have written on this line, Shore Acres Improvement Association, but there are other people's names written on this appeal as well. So say this had been filled out wrong, and they'd put the address on that line, and they'd put the name on the address line. Would you then, I mean, the question is, what level of accuracy is required? That's your argument? I, that's not my argument, but I mean, it's the argument. Well, no, but it's an argument you're making. Formula, yeah. It's going to make the front page of the, is it a main municipal law magazine or something? I mean, this is silly. We, we have... If someone apply, I'm, I'm going to ahead, talk to you. But, you know, there's an applicant that's filed an appeal. You find out that the applicant really was a dissolved corporation. So you're saying, my God, you know, there are other people that signed this application. No, wait, no. But so uh, let's substitute them because they're not dissolved. Who signed the actual uh, appeal, though, is the point. Well, it's in the name of a corporation, okay? But it's signed by an individual. As what? Oh, As individuals? Yeah. No, come on. Well, it is. Well, it's signed by an individual in a, in a capacity. In a capacity. In a capacity, not in an individual capacity. I mean, it is their individual name. I get it. But it's not individually and on behalf of the association in the capacity of a secretary or I mean, that's, that's not what it is. I mean, I, Joanne, I can, I can certainly appreciate your comments. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not even saying I'd necessarily vote like, for my motion, but no, I no, think no, no, it's I'm, worth I'm not, And I'm not suggesting that you're going to vote for it one way or the other. I mean, I, I, I hear your comments, but I look at it as we have, a, we have a, a, an appeal that was filed by an association, not by a bunch of individuals. And the individuals who signed it, signed it in an official capacity. I mean, the association isn't, I mean, it's not going to sign it. It's, it's going to be individuals that are that are in the that are officers of the association. Um, I, I just I think venturing down this, I, I just at, at an, an abundance of, of caution. I think you know, opening it up and saying, well, anyone that signs their name, anyone that sits out there, anyone that remotely participates because they're a member of the association, that means their name now individually is also on the appeal. I mean, that's the floodgate that's opening, and quite frankly, I'm not sure that's, that's our responsibility to do. I didn't fill out the, the appeal. I, I didn't, I mean, that was done by somebody else. It was done by the association. Um, so I, I just, I don't look at it as a situation where we have an association and also people in their individual capacity that are appealing. Are so, ready to call the vote? Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> so 
Yeah, can you read? I think the, the motion was uh, uh, essentially a motion for a substitution. Of the members? Mm -hmm. And uh, who was the second on that? I'll press you with the second. For the sake of having a second. Okay. Um, so uh, those in favor of allowing the substitute of uh, <coughs> the two, <coughs> the, uh, the, the two uh, residents who signed the appeal of uh, September 25th to take the place of the Shore Improvement, Shore Acres Improvement Association. All in favor? I have little faith in the legal standing of people, um, but I'm doing it in a vacuum, but I'm voting yes. With the understanding that we don't have the information to decide whether that's possible or not. I'm going to vote yes. Okay. Uh, all opposed? Motion passes five, <coughs> five, 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 one. Okay, so uh, I, th I think I'm not sure that leaves anything further on this <coughs> appeal. Take the vote to say that it's whether it's upheld or denied. Uh, the actual vote, yeah. Okay, so uh, <coughs> take a vote to um, on the administrative appeal of the Shore Acres Improvement Association uh, on building permit uh, 130072. It allows construction of a boulder wall and deposit of fill within the Shore Acres community deeded right away at 29 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot. 69. Um, those in favor of the appeal? All opposed? Uh, <coughs> Animus 6-0. Six, six okay. Okay. Uh, I'd like to, uh, if we could take a uh, three minute recess.
Uh, okay, we're uh, back in session. Oh, who are we missing? Mr. Schwartz. Oh. Gonna, we can probably at least talk about the procedural, but we're switching. Yeah, um, I, I can't remember. I, I think you just came in. We, we decided uh, at the beginning of the meeting we're going to move the Dennis's up to uh, first on the new business and then take up uh, the matter of um, Friedman. Hopefully. And I was hoping to ask just one. Oh, if the board's okay with it. One question of the no. attorney regarding the prior decisions that were made. Okay. Sure. Just to make sure we're all on the same page. I, yeah, before the variance, if the board's open to it. Sure. It's hopefully it will be a 30 second question. Yeah. <coughs> so, so we took a vote that we're not reopening the prior votes, but I just wanted to make sure that I at least understand what the implications of that are. So we, we've said we're leaving as is the decisions we made under a, in, a overly permissive standard some decisions what will be the implications for the board's decision to the extent that those are appealed to a court um, well if we apply since the permissive standard and then decided to uphold the decision uh, if, even if our decision was ultimately correct but we applied the wrong standard what are the implications to the board it, what will likely happen and I'm only speculating here is that it's likely that the court will consider the, the votes to reconsider here today as an indication of the, whether that standard was something that was determinative of the issues that were addressed in those matters. The court could decide that um, even though we had a board member who previously voted, against, uh, voted in favor of denying the appeal who then also voted in favor of reopening it. Well, you have to have a person who voted in favor of the appeal to have a reconsideration. You can't have a motion for reconsideration by somebody who lost. Got it. Okay. It's, it. And it's commonly done in order to raise an issue to make sure that it was, it was covered. But, but only a person who voted in favor in the first place can do so. So, so we have a situation where um, it appears an improper standard, overly permissive standard was applied. Uh, the decision was reached. We've decided not to revisit it. Uh, potentially it can be appealed to a court. And to the extent that happens, you're saying perhaps, but not clear, our decision not to revisit it might be somehow cleanse the decision? Well, it, two things could happen. What I was, was going to say is um, I'm speculating, but that could be a factor. The other factor could be that the board, in fact, did everything it would be required to do under the de novo review that the court has migrated to, since it's required more specific language in the ordinance to have this hybrid. Um, the court may conclude that, as evidence from the entire record, and the comments of the board, the findings that were actually made by the board, that in fact it made it based upon a standard that didn't rely upon deference. So, so you're, you're saying that um, there's, a, uh, there's a possibility we won't be automatically overturned for applying the wrong standard. That's my concern. Will oh. we automatically be overturned for applying the wrong standard? I, I, I don't think it would be an automatic situation, no. Okay. That, onto the variance, unless anyone else has more questions. Thank you, Attorney Wall. Okay, um, next matter we're going to hear uh, a request of a variance from Jackie and Jeff Dennis for provision of Article 4, Section 19-6-1 to reduce the site setback to 17 feet on the east side of the lot and 20 feet on the <coughs> west side uh, from the required 25 feet ordinance. This is at 5 Ironclad Road, tax map 28, <coughs> lot 6. Good evening. Hi. Could you give your name and address, please? I'm Ann Callender. I'm with Whipple Callender Architects in Portland on behalf of, um, of Jackie and uh, Jeff Dennis. Um, Mrs. Dennis is here also this evening, right here. Um, I'm, I'm an architect, so I'll be working on the common sense and non- <laughs> aspects if I can. I have a feeling and, I'm and going to be regretting that statement for a long, long time. Go on. <laughs> T-shirt will be made. Um, I'm hoping you have the full package um, that we have submitted. We have um, a couple of small site plans. One sort of a mortgage survey, um, an image of, um, which is sort of in front of you also down here, of uh, a drawing 
drawing of the garage and house that exist. And because of um, the strange lot configuration, we're here before you um, to get a uh, side yard setback variance. Um, what they would like to do is they have a single car garage that's um, a, sort of attached to a stone wall that's attached to their house but not directly um, attached um, to their house and they'd like to have a two car garage. So in looking at a way to um, achieve that, we figured that sort of the least impact on the site would be to add five feet to the front of the garage and infill under an existing roof to the rear of the garage that's sort of a wood storage area um, to create a sort of a tandem parking situation. Um, if you see on this little sort of site plan here, I, I've noted in red the area that we're looking to add into the front and then also shade in the back the area that we're looking to infill. Um, and by doing this we will, you know, sort of it's, um, the lot, lot is not in uh, shoreland. It's a conforming lot, but it doesn't conform to um, the setback requirements. And as you'll see that from this little plan that we're right, they have a jog in their property, and they're about a foot off the property line currently, and then the, the property jogs out, um, I believe, 15 feet, or 15 or 16 feet, and then um, goes towards the street 48 feet. So we have the front yard set back, but we don't have um, the 25-foot side yard setbacks because this parcel in the front is only 55 feet wide. Um, so I think our, I don't know how far you want me to go through the application. Recognizing that, uh, that you're not an attorney, uh, can you, are, are you familiar enough with the ordinance to at least step us through how we can issue the variance? And if, if you're not, feel free to say no. Uh, <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. Uh, I can sort of read you the the portions that um, that I filled out in the application in regard to the different uh, points um, that we need to conform to. Okay. Um, and looking at that, so a we need to, the need of the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property, and not the existing conditions, and not to the exist general conditions of the neighborhood. Um, the property is very unique in the way that it um, sort of has this jog um, at the street. And, and I'm going, unless and you can, the board wants to hear, uh, hear you iterate the letter that's included in the packet. Yeah, what, Does anyone else want, her, want, want to hear the presentation on that at this point? I, I think we can just take it into evidence, can't we? Yeah. 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 We, I'm sorry. We'll just, we, we can read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess, uh, I guess the first question I have is just what aspect of the ordinance permits us to grant a variance in this instance is um, and to the extent that we have to dig into the ordinance ourselves. Just tell me that. Aspect of the ordinance. B. page 49 of mine. So... So you're looking for the article of page 49, is that? Section 19-5-2, um, B, variances. And again, this, this is a conforming lot that is not in the shoreland zone, correct? That's correct. Is the, um, was the jog the, in the property <coughs> the result of a historic division off of another parcel by this owner? Not by this owner. I believe it was um, you know, pre-zoning. You can sort of see, I, there's a copy of this map. Like, so it was ages ago before uh, these, yeah. See there's a strange swath here, and then there's additional parcels, and um, the majority of the neighborhood does not meet any of the setback requirements. I think the, um, I think the majority um, average side yard setback is like 11.6 feet for um, those the prop all the other budding properties, and it's a very small you know small single story garage. 
And I, I took this picture here today so you could sort of see just the scale of this in relationship to you know, the closest of our new house. Um, we really won't be coming any further than you know, this tree. And so it doesn't, they don't overlap in any way. It won't be interfering with any views. Um, you know, the ocean is sort of down here, so it's like that, that sort of the other side, of, the lower side of the a hill. Um, you, this driveway is going to afford any views of the, uh, of the water. Uh, what, uh, just out of curiosity, you, so you're doing an, an infill in the in the back, right. and, I, and I noticed in one of the photographs that you've got like, it looks like a couple of propane tanks there. Right. So I may answer my own question, but is there any reason you can't keep going back? Um, in other words, instead of going five feet forward, why not just go an additional five feet back? <coughs> like a guy, you'd have to relo re re relocate. I think those propane tanks. I'm just right. curious if that ever entered the. The discussions at all. Is there more of these construction? So we are getting, as we move back on the site, we are starting to get more of an overlap with an adjacent garage. So I think the lakes, you can sort of see right here this blue area is where you're infilling, and then the neighbor's garage is right there. So that actually starts getting a little. Okay. But I think I see the argument that effectively, if, if you were to solely go backwards instead of also forward, there wouldn't be the need for the variance on the right-hand side because it's not becoming more non-conforming. Okay. Okay. <laughs> to, the, to the extent that the, uh, the expansion of the garage was completely to the back, and I'm not saying that this is an angle. Oh, it's going to overlap, gonna overlap, a, I think it's gonna overlap a lot line. Looks like. Yeah, I think ah, the, the, okay. it starts to converge slightly. All right, and, yeah. got it. Yep. So although it's shown as parallel on the one diagram, as actually laying on the ground, it's slightly askew. It's slightly askew, so I think it does start to pinch it. Right. <coughs> Are there any abutters or neighbors here today who in any way? No, uh, true, you, Mr. Chairman. I did hear, uh, we did receive a phone call from Mr. Arnett of the Arnett Family Trust. Uh, I explained to him what was proposed, where it was proposed. He had no objection to uh, this as proposed, ex making the garage longer. He would have had a concern if it became a two-car garage coming over his stone wall. But uh, he did indicate that this as proposed, uh, he had no objection to. Can he be a butter? He's the abutter. Yeah. He's right. To the um, south. Okay. This is the property right here. This is, this is the property. Okay. Any other questions on the on the board? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The public portion of the program is closed. We thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Anyone have any thoughts, questions? I mean, there's not a lot of wooden room, literally, with that. <laughs> <laughs> with, that, with that garage and um, you know I think that uh, you know, they can't very well go backwards um, so going over the stone wall it looks like or, and uh, you know I, the neighbor I, I think the neighbors seem to be at least the abutter seems to be in favor of it um, I think Looking at the application, it seems to have met, um, you know, the test as far as practical difficulty is required under the statute as well. Does anyone want to make a motion? Well, I just make one comment, and I. I think that the letter basically summarizes the, the points we need to reach, but I did want to point out that 
in granting a variance, there's two factors that we do have to look at. One is that uh, there's no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance, and two, literal, literal enforcement would cause a practical difficulty. And I think this touches on the practical difficulty, but just uh, I would like to make one comment on the substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance, and I don't think there is a substantial departure, so, unless anyone disagrees with me. I don't disagree with you. Can I move that we approve the um, request for a variance from Jackie and Jeff Dennis for from the provisions of Article 4, Section 19-6-1 to reduce the side setback to 17 feet on the east side of the lot and 20 feet on the west side from the required 25 feet at 5 Ironclad Road, tax map U8, lot 6. I have a second? No second. I appreciate the motion at, on, immediately on the table is um, to ex accept it as under the ordinance. Uh, the usual practice when approving a, a variance is to go through each one of the criteria, and I don't know whether that was the next step after the Yeah, I was going to do that after the vote, but okay. maybe I should I just wanted before. to make sure that it was part of the process. All right. That's why you have a rookie as the chairman today. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> so I'm, I'm taking a council suggest we do the finding of facts first. It gets in the record. Okay. I'd prefer it first. All right. So we'll, we'll do it first because. I, I, ideally, in a vacuum, my view is that we should do findings of fact first every instance because otherwise it can create the appearance the tail's wagging the dog. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> fine with that. Okay. Um, can we, so. Withdrawing the motion for the time being? Sure. Or tabling? <laughs> table, we'll table it for table the time being. Then I don't have to say it again. Oh, you may have to. <laughs> uh, okay. The findings of facts. Um, First one is uh, Ann Calendar on behalf of Jackie and Jeff Dennis, the owners of Five Ironclad Road, have filed an application for a variance to add to the front and rear of an existing garage. No one in favor? Opposed? Six zip. The required setback is uh, in the RA zone, is, uh, the, I'm, let me start over again. The required side setback in the RA zone is 25 feet. And just as a comment on that, uh, this is applicable because I believe the garage is over 100 square feet in size. But <coughs> duly noted. All in favor? Opposed? Six zip. The plan submitted requests a variance to reduce the side setback on one side to 17 feet and to reduce the side setback on the opposite side to 20 feet. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Uh, I guess we should probably put in here that, um, as well, that the um, compliance with the ordinance would, uh, uh, would create a practical difficulty as defined by 30A, 30A, MRSA, section 443534C. I'm going to stop there. Um, all in favor? Opposed? Okay. And there's another. Am I missing a condition? Should we go through each of the individual? The unique circumstances and the undesirable change. Yeah. And all that? Yes, okay. Um, the, the need, okay, so A, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not a general condition of the neighborhood. All in favor? Opposed? The granting, the granting of, the, of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. It will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or property, or I'm sorry, market value of abutting properties. In favor? Opposed? <coughs> the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. All in favor? Opposed? No other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the petitioner. All in favor? Opposed? 
the granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Uh, so with that, um, we had a motion to approve uh, <coughs> variance uh, from Jackie and Jeff Dennis um, for provision of Article 4, Section 19-6-1 to reduce the site setback to 17 feet on the east side of the lot and 20 feet on the west side from the required 25 feet. This is at 5 Ironclad Road, tax map U8, lot 6. All in favor? Opposed? I can do that. Uh, uh, Mr. Jeff Schwartz. <coughs> okay. The uh, variance is approved. Thank you. Okay. Um, next matter before the board is. Uh, to hear an administrative appeal by Harry and Mary Friedman of the Code Enforcement Officer's issuance of Building Permit 120434 for an expansion of a structure of 40 Surf Road, tax map U05, lot 42, regarding the area and volume of the structure, the building footprint, and the building height. Before we start on this, can I disclose to the board that um, historically I um, rented a property to the Mallory's and I don't believe this would have any this was years ago and I don't believe it would have any impact on my objectivity in this but I wanted to disclose it and if the board believes otherwise then and I also have another issue to raise but let's start I guess I shouldn't be involved in your decision because of the fact that I have to raise mine I also believe I need to recuse myself because of the fact that the Mallory's uh, son is good friends with my daughter to the extent that we have pieces of their artwork in our house, um, so it's beyond just merely classmates. So, it, <laughs> it, w he, he, he is on a first name basis in our house. So, I believe I, I I'm, I'm certain I need to excuse myself because of artwork in your house. Uh, there's a little bit more early. <laughs> They're good friends. Okay. Not gonna, not, so. It's not an interrogation. I'm just <laughs> that's what we common sense. Uh, <clears throat> Okay. Uh, but that leaves at least the, the board needs to decide. Yeah. Recuse. Yeah. We, we, yeah you so let's start with my. You can't up and, and go. You got to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, okay. So. Well, if he wants to recuse himself, we still have to vote on whether we agree with him to recuse himself. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And if you want me to give you more detail, I can. But I don't think there's. Okay. Going on, but. <laughs> Daughter. But. Uh, okay, well, it, again, without getting, you think it's a conflict because? It, uh, I personally believe I am not in any way biased by it, but it isn't a matter of what I think, it's about the public appearance, and is there the risk of a perception of bias? And the two children are very close friends mm -hmm. from my side of things. Mm -hmm. um, there have been multiple interactions with them. There's only one in one child by that name in our household when the, the name comes up. So mm -hmm. it, it, there, it, it's more than just uh, <coughs> classmates. They know each other. <coughs> we have pieces of artwork that he's drawn for her that are in our house. So okay. it reaches, in, from my perspective, the level that it can create the appearance of bias. So from my perspective, that then requires me to recuse myself. OK. All right. Um, so should we? Take a vote on that, or okay, take a vote on that. All in favor of Mr. Straw recusing himself and being able to leave early? <laughs> and I'll be staying either way, <laughs> but sitting in the back. Uh, all in favor? Anyone opposed? With that. And. You're I am not asking to recuse myself, but if anyone wants to make a motion that I get to go home, I'd be fine with that. <laughs> uh, you rented property to the Mallory's years ago? Seven, ten years yeah. ago. Not, yeah. not, and not obviously the subject property? No, not even in this town. 
Jeez. Okay. What a coincidence. Right. Anyone have any thoughts on that? Jeff or Josh? Barry? Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So we can proceed. Good evening. My name is Martha Gaithwaite, and I represent Harold and Mary Friedman, who live at 36 Surf Road in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you very much for staying so late this evening. I'll try not to take too much of your time. I believe you have the board packet that contains our administrative appeal. Harold and Mary Friedman have lived at 36 Surf Road since 1988. This is the first time they have ever been before the Zoning Board of Appeals. And it's also the first time they've ever had to file any sort of an objection or a complaint against a neighbor. They would definitely prefer not to be here, but they're here because on October 11th of this year, Mary woke up, opened up her bedroom curtain and looked out and there was a gentleman on the uh, roof a few feet away doing work on the house next door. It was something Can you introduce yourself, please, sir? Um, excuse me, you have to come to the microphone, please. I am sorry to interrupt. Uh, I am Attorney John Bannon. I am uh, representing the appellees uh, Baird and Leah Mallory in this matter. Um, there is an issue of whether this appeal is timely or not. Uh, if the appeal is not timely, then this court has no jurisdiction, pardon me, this board has no jurisdiction to take any action in this matter, including the taking of evidence uh, with regard to whether there is just cause for an extension, since you cannot give one. Hence, I object to the board's uh, uh, accepting evidence or testimony from the Freedmen's or their representatives with regard to the issue of timeliness. Thank you. Please continue. Thank you. And it's my obligation as counsel for the Freedmen's to make sure we have a clear administrative record, and that is a point of my comments. I think I was at the point uh, of saying that Mary looked out her bedroom window, and at the house nine feet from the property line, there were gentlemen working on the roof. That came as a shock to Mary, not only because she did not expect to see men looking in her bedroom window, but also because she has been in regular contact with the Mallorys. They are very um, frequent neighbors. Their son spends a lot of time at the Friedman household. And even though the Friedmans have had regular contact with the Mallorys and their family, they never knew about this proposed construction until October 11th. And just so you understand, why we're here. This is a photo of the Mallory's <coughs> house, and this construction is the principal issue that we're here about, and the windows that are about to be obscured by the construction is um, Mary and Harold's bedroom window. So that's the window that she was looking out of when she saw folks From her bedroom window, for the last 20 years, she and Harold have been able to look out at the shipping channel in the Atlantic Ocean. Mary immediately went next door to talk to her neighbors. They were not home. She uh, told the workmen that she objected to the work, and she asked them to please stop. She immediately called ba Baird Mallory, told him that she was quite upset and that she objected to the construction that seemed about ready to start. The next thing that Mary did is that she went to the town office and she tried to find out what sort of permit had been issued for this work because she had no notice of any permit. When she went to the town office, she was given permits that dated back to 2009. There were no recent permits provided to her, even though she was told that she had been given the complete file for 40 Surf Road. Ma'am, can I interrupt you for just sure. a second? I, I don't mean to do this to be throwing you off. There's a pending case in Superior Court, correct? 
That's correct. What are the causes of action that you have in, in that matter? In that matter, we have raised a nuisance claim. We have also raised a trespass claim. We have also raised a failure basically to do to get a proper permit and have also claimed that because the Mallory's did not give my clients notice of the permit, they're in the predicament that they're in now where construction has started pursuant to a permit and they were deprived the opportunity to be heard with respect to that permit and to present their objections back in uh, at the time that permit was issued. Are, are any of the claims that have been filed in, in I'm assuming it's Cumberland Superior, are any of those claims similar to this appeal? The, the issues overlapping? Well, they're, they're, they're related. Um, normally, in the normal course of events, what would have happened is my clients would have had an opportunity to come here. They would have presented their objections. We believe that you would not have allowed this permit to stand, and that would have then either led to a, the construction not going forward or to the Mallory's filing some sort of an appeal to the Superior Court to find out whether your decision was correct. What happened in this case is because we did not have notice that as soon as we got a copy, got notice by the gentleman standing on the roof, we notified the Mallory's. Matt, Mary went next door and talked to the workmen, then called Mr. Mallory, then met with Mr. Mallory. I sent Mr. Mallory a couple of letters and said, hey, we don't even think you have a valid permit. Um, and they continued to do the work and basically have continued to this day to do the work. We were uh, still trying to find a copy of the permit. We had to file a freedom of access request to get a copy of the permit file. We didn't get that. I believe it was October 29th or 30th that we finally got that permit file. By then we had already filed in Superior Court because we had no legal grounds to uh, do anything else. So they're related. Um, if we certainly would have preferred to have the normal processes work where we went to the Zoning Board of Appeals and it was handled that way. Because we were not given notice, we ended up having to do a superior court. So there is an element of our claim. What's the cause of action? You said there was a cause of action for failure to issue a permit? No, failure to give notice. Um, I expect that what is going to happen here, and I think it would be a miscarriage of justice if it were to happen, but I think that what you're going to hear next is the Mallory say, oh, this is untimely. We do not believe this appeal is untimely. But if it is, that we believe is solely the result of a conscious and deliberate effort by the Mallory's to conceal this permit issuance from my clients who are their neighbors. And I think that they can't, on the one hand, conceal notice of the permit and then argue that, gee, it's untimely, and then basically go to Superior Court and not have to explain to the judge why that happened. So they're related <coughs> concepts, but they're not identical. Well, I get, I, what's the gist of the, the cause of action? There, there, there was a cause of action, you said that there was a failure to give notice cause of action? Yeah, there really, I could not find any case law because frankly I haven't found a case like this. Um, I, the not not Justice Hortons, the, you know. The, the, clo uh, the closest remedy or the, the most analogous situation would be almost interference with an advantageous business relationship okay. that um, it does not, it seems fundamentally unfair for somebody to not let their neighbors know about a project that they know their neighbors are going to object to and then to claim now that I've succeeded in concealing this from you and you haven't had a chance to appeal, I'm going to take the position in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals that it's too little too late. Um, we hope that we don't, that I get to drop that count because I hope that you will reach the merits of this administrative appeal, which I think is a very strong appeal on its merits. Um, but before we get there, I have to explain to you why I believe that this is one of those cases where it really would be a miscarriage of justice and, and why I think that um, you should hear this appeal. 
And going to that point, I know that we have heard a very similar matter in the not too distant past. And I'm wondering if here as there, we should address the timeliness issue first and yep. separately. And that's, I'm trying to set the administrative record because in that case, it's my understanding that what happened was the Murphys actually came to the town during the appeal period, went to speak, I believe, with the code enforcement officer, but for whatever reason, decided not to file an administrative appeal. In this circumstance, what we have is my clients not knowing about it at all and within a few days of receiving a copy of the permit file pursuant to the Freedom of Access request, they filed this administrative appeal. And what um, we believe that there really are three reasons why you can reach the merits of this appeal, why it is not untimely, and why you should do it. Um, and the first is that it really would be an injustice. Uh, there is no question that my clients did not know about this permit issuance. And in addition to that, um, we have an email from Mr. Mallory where it's very clear that he knew that he told my clients about the project and about the permit issuance that they would object. You're going to hear that the, um, what happened was that because my client's property is within nine, the, the Mallory's properties um, structure is within nine feet of the property line, they would be in violation of minimum setback requirements. There was a discussion with the contractor and with the architect about whether they needed to get an additional foot from the Freedmans. And the architect said, why don't you go over to your neighbors and tell them that you might want to buy a foot of property. And so what Mr. Mallory said to his architect was, we need a 10-foot plan. Once the 30-day period of plan contestation is over, I'm thinking of asking my neighbors if they sell me a wedge of property that might include the one foot necessary. Not sure how that will go, but it's going to be displeased about the addition. So we know that Mr. Mallory knew that the Freedmans would object, and Mary can explain to you some of the background of that, that he knew that they would object, and he specifically wanted to make sure he didn't talk to them within the 30-day period, um, because he knew they would object. I think it would be a miscarriage of justice um, for you not to reach the substance of an appeal when it's very clear, and I'm going to take my word for it, this is Mr. Mallory's own words, that, that was a deliberate decision to make sure that his neighbors did not know about the project before um, he had the 30-day appeal, appeal period had passed. Um, was, to he save, was he required to tell them by law? Um, I don't think that he's required by law to tell them in terms of, is there a statute that says, thou shalt give your neighbor a um, notice. Do I think that it is a tortious interference with their fundamental rights? I certainly do. Do I think that it's improper conduct? Yes, I do. Do I think it's actionable? Yes, I do. Um, but looking to the ordinance, sorry. Looking to the ordinance, is it the case that the town, upon issuance of building permit, requires posting of the building permit? There is nothing in the town ordinance that requires the neighbors to tell their other neighbors about the issuance of the permit. I would recommend that that might be a practice you want to follow. Yes. It is not a practice now. Um, but I don't know that that is really as important as saying, however they found out, did my clients immediately take steps to protect their rights and to object to the project. This is not a circumstance where they just sort of thought about it, didn't do anything about it, maybe went to the town office. They immediately acted, and I think that's why this is different than the Murphy and Livingston matter. And to save some time, I tried to and put I'm, together. And I'm not hearing anything yet, at least. This isn't a situation where the Freedmans approached them and said, hey, it looks like you're building something, and they turned around and said, no, we're not. 
during the 30-day time period. I mean, they, no, they, they didn't they, commence construction until after the passage of the 30-day period. Is that right? That's right. They they waited until, and, I, and there's nothing that requires that they start within 30 days, right? The requirement is that they start within six months. But I also think that the um, way the law works, that if you are deliberately waiting until the 30-day period goes by, that um, you really and suggest that um, you're going to object on technical grounds. The reality is that if the Mallory's didn't object, um, I think that it would be a slam dunk. You guys should listen to this appeal. You should listen to the merits. And when you listen to the merits, I think that you will find out that there's a lot here that should never have been allowed by the code enforcement officer. So this, this is not a is that the building permit issues, there's no notice requirement to neighbors or to anyone else, there's no posting requirement for the building permit, and there is a 30-day appeal period, but no requirement that construction commence within the 30-day period. So that is essentially, correct. your contention is that those are the regulations, you don't disagree that those are what they are, but that the Mallory's were essentially gaming those regulations in order to prevent there being any appeal of their permit. What I am, I think in our appellate package, we provided you folks copies of the bracket decision by the law court. There is well-established main case law that says, whereas here, there will be a miscarriage of justice because the neighbor did not get notice and did not have an opportunity to be heard that the Zoning Board of Appeals or planning board should be able to reach the merits of the appeal. That is a circumstance that we have here that essentially what would happen is if we go to the Superior Court, I don't think there's a serious question but that the Superior Court will look at the email, look at the testimony from my clients that they had no notice or reason to have any suspicion that this work was going to be done that the court will find that there is a miscarriage of justice and will send it back and you will then have to decide the substantive merits of the case. I think that that is not the appropriate way to handle it. It seems to me a much better practice for the town and for all involved would be for you to reach the substantive merits of the appeal. Um, I also note that under your statute or your ordinance, Section 1953E, when it talks about the situation where somebody files uh, an objection in front of you, you make a decision, and then you're not supposed to um, look at that similar issue again for a year. There is language in there that talks about the ability to file a new appeal or a new application within, in one year if the board finds that there would be an injustice that would result. I think that language is broad enough to cover this circumstance, and if you were to find, as I think you should, that this would be an injustice for neighbors not to be given an opportunity to be heard, uh, that you should decide this case on its merits. So it, you're essentially asking that um, we apply the good cause exception in bracket to this case, is that right? That's part of our argument, yes. And are you, can you then talk about um, what begins at pay star 428, um, the standard of review in the bracket case, which states that the court states that we have decided that application of the good cause exception is a decision to be made judicially rather than administratively to prevent local arbitrariness? I and think talk that about how we could get around that because I believe the decision that we made last time was that the decision to apply the good cause exception is not one that we have the authority to make, that it must be made by a court and that that appears to be what the bracket case also decided. I understand that and I understand that that is the advice that's been given to you by your town attorney. What I am suggesting to you is that in the Brackett versus Rangeley case, which was a 2003 decision, which is 
consistent with the Keating decision and the Gagne versus Chimbro decision from 10 or 15 years earlier, that there is an established body of case law that says that when you have a good grounds for finding there's been a miscarriage of justice, that it is fundamentally unfair not to allow an administrative board to reach the merits of the appeal. In this particular case, I think we have a bracket exception that is not an arbitrary argument that I'm making saying, oh, we waited six months, please listen to our appeal. We have a situation where by the Mallory's own admission, they knew that the Freedmans would object and they deliberately did not let them know about this within the 30-day period. That's part of our argument. The other argument that we have is a more substantive um, argument, and that is that when you have a permit application which contains inaccurate information, as this one does, and you are in a situation where you are now <laughs> Um, it can correct that, that you should, and that the 30-day appeal period really is only applicable where there is no allegation that there's any inaccurate or incomplete information in the application. What we have here, and I think that uh, it is under tab three of your uh, packet that I just gave you, we have... Um, deposition testimony of Mr. Mallory uh, on page 159 to 160, where he has admitted that the application that was filed contains inaccurate information. The application that was presented to Mr. Smith said that there would not be any enlargement of the existing footprint, and he also, it says, that there would not be any addition of bedrooms uh, Mr. Mallory has testified at his deposition that, in fact, that information is inaccurate and that the permit application does not reflect what actually is uh, going on here. In addition to that, the project is going to end up being closer to the water than it is now. There's going to be a stair tower, a new foundation that is going to be closer to the Atlantic Ocean than the northwest wall of the house is now. So is your that, argument also essentially that this is work that couldn't have been done with just a building permit, that it should properly have gone before the planning board? Right, right. And that it is really a, it seems to me that your 30-day appeal period is applicable when you have something clearly within the code enforcement officer's jurisdiction you have complete and accurate information in that application. The code enforcement officer makes a decision on that application, either granting it or denying it, and then a person has the right to appeal to you either within the 30 days or if there's manifest injustice sometime after, but that those deadlines should not apply in a circumstance like this where I don't think this code enforcement officer had the ability to enter the decisions or the authority, jurisdiction, to enter the opinions or decision that he did. One of the things that we have found out, again, at Mr. Mallory's deposition, is that in 2007 or 2008, a Mr. Coombs had performed a survey of the property. In that survey, it talks about the uh, normal high water mark. He, on his survey, said, I did not independently verify it. I'm just going by a 1926 plan. In 2012, Mr. Coombs was asked to come back <coughs> out to the property and to try to establish the actual annual high tide line. When he went out and redid his survey, in fact, it turned out that the 2008 survey that was based on a 1926 survey was not accurate, and he submitted a, or prepared a new plan that more accurately shows the setbacks and the waterline. It is significant because 
most if not all of the house is now within 75 feet of the water. For reasons that we do not understand because Mr. Smith is on administrative leave and we can't find out why he apparently did this um, and there's nothing in the file to explain it, but according to Mr. Mallory's deposition, which is again under tab three and it's pages 104 to 105, he claims that Mr. Smith decided to grandfather the inaccurate plan and to use the inaccurate plan as opposed to the accurate plan. I do not... Well, aren't we getting into the details of the case when we really haven't yet determined whether or not the, uh, the appeal was timely? And can I make a comment on that? I, I think something's wrong with the system as they have it now. People can apply for building permits or, or appeals or, or whatever the, 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 uh, uh, the process is without notifying the butters. I know that notice does appear in some obscure town publication, but there has to be a different system where maybe you have to notify a butters when you're doing something like this. And the assessor's office can provide a list of a butters, then you have to send them notice or letters or whatever they, they, you, you determine. You get back to your cards and say that. Uh, uh, mail was delivered, so at least all your butters are notified. So you don't have this. Yeah, but I, if it's so secretive that somebody can apply for a, uh, a building permit, I, without, I think we've talked. I mean, again, we've in a way seen this movie before, and um, we okay. had we had the same general. I mean. Well, somebody should do that about it. I don't mean to interrupt you, but that, uh, Mr. Well, can you do something about this? I think it would be worthwhile for us. I know the Ordinance Committee is meeting right now, and I think it would be worthwhile for us to ask that they look at this issue of yeah. what notice is required, or at least what construction period is applicable for building permits. I mean, whatever this the, is kind of aside from the appeal. Whatever the system but, is, put something in place so you avoid this. And in this particular case, I would hope that we would take a vote to accept this appeal. Well, because of these circumstances, and it would be unfair if they didn't. I do think that this case is shaping up to be substantially different from the last one we saw in that it, it appears that the, there are allegations in this case that it wasn't work that could properly be done under a building permit, and thus that notice <coughs> to a <abut> butter. <coughs> certainly if, you went, if, they, <coughs> if it is accurate that build, bedrooms were added, and that kind of thing, then planning board approval would have been required, and then notice to the abutters would have been required. And so the circumstances here are substantially different from the last case we had where it was clearly just a building permit. Uh, and I don't know uh, how much of a difference uh, this makes, but... Um, I, yeah, I, th I think that the... Uh, I, I, I still think we face the issue of, a, of an appeal that was filed well past the 30 days. An appeal of a building permit, but here we have a circumstance where, yes, it's an appeal of a building permit, but the building permit itself was, not, was arguably not proper. It should have been a planning board permit. I, I do agree with the characterization. I would like to have an opportunity to rebut that before that. Well, you, you, I think you'll have your opportunity. I think we're just trying to sort it out ourselves right now. Um, I, 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 do, I do wonder, I guess, whether um, 1953E, which uh, the attorney referenced, you know, in, in, in a way provides uh, the opportunity to page is that in your, uh, sorry. Well, I, what color is your book? <laughs> okay, we got the same book, it's page 53, bottom of 53. And it speaks to, um, this, this is assuming a decision has already been made, but it, it, it basically allows for um, the review of a, of a uh, <coughs> to the extent that owing to a mistake of the law or a misunderstanding of a fact or an, in, an injustice was done or that a change has taken place in some essential aspect of the case sufficient to warrant reconsideration. So, But isn't that a decision of the board? I mean, that's 
Well, but my only point was that it it speaks to after the fact, but right. isn't it? I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm going to apply some common sense again. If does this mean if if we were simply to say we're, we're you know we're going to um, de deny this <coughs> on the 30 day, which, which it is, um, but then a year from now it gets filed again because. Um, e either of a bracket consideration or we just found out about two bedrooms being added or what have you, then why are we waiting? I mean, just asking the question. And unfortunately, there's more um, problems with the permit, which I believe the record will show this code enforcement officer would not have had the authority to issue the permit that was issued. In the file, there is absolutely no information with respect to the degree to which this structure was going to be increased by square footage or by volume. This is in a shoreland zone it is a non-conforming structure on a non-conforming lot. There is nothing in the permit application, and I'm not sure why Mr. Smith did not require that, but there's nothing in the permit application to show that there would not be an increase beyond the 30 percent limits. We do have under um, the final two tabs in the packet I gave you, the first is a letter from an architect pointing out problems with the plans that were submitted and the fact that if you go by the plans that are, were submitted, you have a, an increase over the 30 percent limit. And then the final tab, tab six, has a list of different plans and information that we have received now from the Mallory's, which were not provided to Mr. Smith, and it shows changes in the calculations of what was allegedly existing. You have different calculations on September 8th of 2009 that are different than the ones that were on November 7th of 2011, that are different than the ones on September 24th of 2012, which are different than the ones that were in the letter that Attorney Bannon sent on November 13th, 2012. So in terms of what the code enforcement officer would have had the legal authority to do, there's nothing in the file that would have allowed him to issue this permit because there's nothing to show that there wouldn't have been an increase beyond 30 percent. And I think that the record is that there is a serious question um, that they have already violated the 30 percent limits and that is something that should have been stopped. In addition to that, because this is within nine feet of the property line, we believe you really can't be doing any work on that section of the building because it's already below the minimum setback. But if you look at tab two, Apparently what's happened is that the Mallory's have taken the position that, well, gee, it was okay for us to build a second floor as long as it's 10 feet back. Um, and so they basically have indented their non-conforming structure and have suggested that that would meet the ordinance. I don't believe that it does, and I believe you have the authority to make an interpretation about whether it does or does not. What I think is striking is that even if you believe that you can somehow indent your way into compliance, which I don't think you can, when you look at tab two in a picture of Mr. Mallory showing a ruler, you will see this white line. That is where the wall is now. It is nine feet from Harold and Mary's property line. And you will see that unlike the permit application plans that were submitted to Mr. Smith, instead of heading indented, you will see there's a section of, of roof that goes within the nine foot 
setback. So that would be a violation of what is shown on the plans. If you go up further, you see the roof again extends back out into the nine foot setback. So that is not work that is uh, authorized by the ordinance by any stretch of the imagination. You just can't be building within nine feet. And that is. Well, I think that our legal argument in our administrative appeal is based on the three factors that I just stated. One is it's a miscarriage of justice. Two is I don't believe that this code enforcement officer had the authority to issue this permit. Three is we are in a situation where we have misrepresentations or inaccuracies in the plans that were submitted in the permit application that was submitted. And four, as of last Monday, the Mallory's <coughs> architect was submitting new plans for this same project to the town office. So we have a project that is still apparently in its development stages. And again, I don't think you can do that. I don't think that the um, permit that was issued in June really can then somehow bless new changes that happen in September. So I think this is an administrative mess, and what I'm addressing is the work that's going on out at 40 Surf Road. We don't believe that it is legal. We don't think it complies with the permit that was issued. We don't think the code enforcement officer had jurisdiction to issue it, and we think it would be a manifestly unjust situation for you not to reach the merits of that uh, a permit. So are you also arguing that there were new plans that essentially amended the existing permit submitted in the past week? Last Monday there were plans submitted to the town and we asked for the uh, town, uh, I guess you're the acting code enforcement officer to bring the file so you don't take my word for it but my understanding is that they submitted some amended plans uh, last Monday. In addition to that, if you, you look... Describe some of those changes, whether they were substantial or just kind of typographical or... What we're trying to do is to have our architect who submitted the letter um, about the problems with the volume and square footage um, issues to look at those more closely and compare them to what uh, is actually being built out there. So. We just found out about this, and I haven't gotten a somebody who can tell me more specifically than that there were three plans and there are some changes being made. Part of the problem is that when Mary went to the town office, there were all sorts of plans about all sorts of work that ended up never being done. And then there was this permit application filed in June that nobody could find, that we finally had to do the freedom of access request for, that we finally got, and then we got some um, plans in connection with that. But then as you look through the emails that we got um, as part of discovery in our lawsuit, it looks like there have been changes in terms of roof line and copper valleys and doing different truss work uh, because they apparently have found other problems. They're talking about putting this stair tower and either digging out ledge or putting in a foundation, but they're not really quite sure how they're going to handle that. There's a lot of changes that are still apparently being discussed. I'm not a builder and I'm not an architect, so I can't represent to you how significant they are, but it seemed to me to make common sense that if they thought it important enough to come to the town last Monday, the 19th, and submit plans, they must have thought there was some reason that you folks would need to know that. So it's kind of a moving target, and it seems to me that that would be another reason for us to have the ability to have somebody look at the actual work that's going on out there, see whether it complies with what was issued, see whether what was issued actually was within the code enforcement officer's authority, and we, in addition to filing our administrative appeal, had suggested that alternatively, this is work that should be shut down because it is not authorized. So I think either as a direct administrative appeal of the issuance of the building permit or as 
part of your authority to interpret the ordinance um, that you could direct the acting code enforcement officer to go out there and to make sure that what we have claimed is correct, that this work really is not within the purview of the original permit that was issued and also that what is being done would not have been allowed uh, to be within the jurisdiction of the code enforcement officer. It's a serious matter. We have uh, submitted to you photos under tab four of the f um, before and after pictures, but essentially, as I showed you on the blow up, the structure that originally existed had two flat roofs and what happened was those two flat roofs have now been changed considerably so we have a second story and an attic over both of those two um, what had been flat roofs that afforded the Freedmen's a uh, view of the water. I'm happy to have Mary Friedman explain to you from her perspective what uh, history is behind this administrative appeal and how she found out about what happened uh, on October 11th and also tell you about prior discussions with the Mallorys so that it would have been very clear to them that they would have objected to this project if they had been given notice of the project. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, what I, I think we're I'm at is that there are two things I think that I'm hearing that we need to resolve. Um, one is one is our old friend the timeliness issue, and and the the other I, I think in some respects is 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 whether the uh, CEO exceeded his authority, you know, relative to the issuance of the permit. It sounds like some of this may have been planning board related and um, uh, I, I guess to that end I'm not I guess this is maybe a, a, a question for you counselor um, whether we have the, the uh, what if you don't mind coming up and Um, I, I guess the question I have is, does this board have the ability to, um, or jurisdiction, I guess, I mean, if the, if the code enforcement officer is issuing something belongs in some other venue, do we have the ability to say, you exceeded your authority and it belongs in a different venue? I mean, in other words, can we, can we entertain the evidence on that basis and, and Render, yeah, it doesn't belong here. It doesn't. Go ahead, sorry. There, there's a there's a there's a lot of law on this issue, uh, but there is there are have been some decisions by the court that has suggested that if if the challenge to what the uh, CEO did is in effect a sort of a collateral attack on the building permit, then the the building permit has to stand if it's if it's not appealed in a timely fashion. Now there may be other avenues other than the administrative process that a party could pursue in order to see whether or not a court would grant relief um, as, it, as it being an unauthorized action on the part of the town. But that involves different considerations that a court, uh, as I understand the law, is uniquely postured to deal with in terms of uh, dealing with vested rights of the other parties to the appeal and those type of issues that all have to be balanced as part of that equation. So my my opinion based upon what I've read in this area would be that to the extent you're dealing with a, a challenge which would be in effect a collateral attack on the, on the permit that, um, that the timeliness issue would still apply to that kind of... The, the timeliness issue would, but I guess my question is putting the timeliness issue aside, can, can, you, can you still hear the appeal because the permit was not uh, may not have been issued properly in the first place. In my opinion, no. Uh, as I indicated, I don't think you can divorce. I don't think you can divorce it from the timeliness issue. Is my point. 
What about the kind of evolving nature of the the application where there's new plans that have come in, kind of circumstances are changed where we don't necessarily have a... Yeah, it, I'd like to answer that first as the interim code enforcement officer. I, you know, we, we did get a plan the other day. It wasn't accompanied by any application. We simply put it in the file. You know, that, that the, the building permit that exists and the one that must be adhered to and the one that will be enforced is the one that was issued in June. Everything else that, you know, that we're hearing is immaterial. The only permit that exists is the one that was issued in June. Uh, what, why this other plan came in, I don't know. It wasn't explained to me. Uh, it, has, the, it has no standing in terms there, of the permit itself. Were there changes on that plan that were I have not studied the, that, uh, excuse me. Such that maybe a new permit or an amended permit would be necessary? There was no application for amended permit. The, the code enforcement. <laughs> I wouldn't imagine there would be. No, the code, the code enforcement that will be done will be the enforcement of the existing permit and to make sure that everything would, you know, whether the permit was granted appropriately or not, the, the, the standard that we will follow will be we will enforce the permit as it was approved unless we're instructed otherwise. I guess the, 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 the thing that I keep, I, mean, I, I hear what some of the concerns is, you know, did, did the code enforcement officer exceed the authority <coughs> to issue it? But I look at that as like, that's still a decision in my mind that's still, I mean, unless I'm wrong, I, I still see that that's a, a decision that's go governed under 19.53 that if he exceeds his authority, well, then you got 30 days to appeal that decision that was made. It's not just the way I read the, the plain reading of, of, this, of, of our code and, and the language, it, it's not you have 30 days from the issuance of a permit. It's, it's you have 30 days from the decision that's made by the code enforcement officer. The decision was to do something that exceeded the authority that, I mean, I look at it as that's, that's governed under 19.53. I don't, I don't see where it's, well, and I think what, where it doesn't fall there. Okay, and just to be clear, I think what I heard, heard town council say is that, he, you know, again, let's put the 30 day window, let, let's say we're, 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 we're beyond, uh, well, we'll assume we're beyond it, but the, the permit was nevertheless issued Incorrectly, that 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 by that by itself doesn't give doesn't give rise to to our ability to review review the the, the, the permit and the, and the circumstances under which it was issued. And I mean, not even just somewhat incorrectly. If if he had issued a permit granting somebody a permit to build a house in the middle of a street, we can't. If if an appeal isn't made within thirty days, that's not our we don't have the power to do anything about that. In, in my view of the, of the law, it would not be something that could be redressed through an administrative appeal. It would have to be some other method that a complaining party would have to seek redress from the Superior Court to say that it was an unauthorized action. Because like I said, from that point, the Superior Court then evaluates not only the substantive merits of that argument, but also the impact of, well, what reliance does the landowner have who was given the permit, how does that relate to various issues of, um, you know, uh, possible uh, prejudice to them by taking actions based upon it in good faith? <coughs> All of these matters are, are appropriately addressed, I would suggest, in other form, not in this forum, not for the administrative appeal. Because I mean, I, I just don't see how we have the authority to administer, you know, doctrines of equitable tolling. I mean, I just don't see, I mean, I, I just don't see how we have my it. My question was, you know, was the appeal period told due to the changes in the construction that was undertaken pursuant to the permit, such that, you know, those new plans that came in were maybe, we don't know whether they should or should not have been an amendment to well, the Well, presumably, permit. they're, whatever they're building, they're building pursuant to the June permit. They haven't applied for another. And, and if there's a deviation from the June permit, 
And we don't have the authority to require right. enforcement but, action. But, 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 the, but the code enforcement officer, if he feels that the plans are inconsistent with the June permit, <laughs> says, guess what? The plans are inconsistent with the June permit. Shut it down. And then they can, they can appeal that decision if they want. When it's, I mean, that's. Did you look at the plans to see if they were consistent with the permit? Uh, through you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I didn't look at the plan. I, there wasn't an application with it. it. I wasn't sure why I received it. There was no cover letter. Uh, just simply said, put it in the file, and we notified uh, Attorney Gaithwaite as well that this plan had come in because she had filed the Freedom of Information request. But have you gone out and taken a look to see if the the work complies with the permit? I have not personally <coughs> measured it. Uh, I, I'm unsure if Rich Steller who's working with us from the city of South Portland uh, has actually measured it as of this point. Uh, you know, actually, to, to, I've sort of been waiting for this meeting uh, to see how this resolved without trying to interfere with the, the purviews of the uh, zoning board uh, by taking any interim action. While there was an appeal pending before you, it, it didn't seem like it was the best move to unilaterally go out and uh, make other changes. I mean, pres I'm getting technical for a second. I mean, presumably uh, there have been plans filed with this June 8th building permit. Correct. But what we have is, or what we've seen is that on this tab five and six, there are pretty substantial differences between plans that were submitted with the application and what's on the new plans or what's actually being done. Okay. Well. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, are you all set with me? Can I'm all set with you. Thank you. Sorry. Um. I guess I'm just struggling with saying that the 30-day appeal period ran from the date that the original permit was issued and there's no right to appeal, even where there have been substantial changes as recently, I guess, as last week to the work that's being done under that permit. And well, we don't know. Is there, anything, is there anything preventing us from attaching to whatever our decision is the, re the, the request that the code enforcement officer will um, inspect the property and ensure that the that the plans as submitted with the June uh, June 8th 2013 building permit are being adhered to and if they're not then we we give him the authority that that he's got he's got to, I don't know what the right terminology is but let's just call it issue a C and D until you know, we, we, we've seen more, more information. Obviously, I'm just thinking out loud here. But. Yeah, because it would certainly seem to me if I were, and, you know, we haven't heard from the Mallory's yet, and that probably makes sense too, but it would seem to me that if I were them and I was submitting new plans and didn't hear anything back from the town, I would kind of assume, <clears throat> hey, I'm okay to go ahead with what I told the town I was doing. Unfortunately, there's an appeal before the ZBA. <laughs> so, I mean, it's now risen. To, that, that may be the case. I mean, but that's a, you know, again, that may be another issue that has to be addressed as part of the, you know, the committee that's looking at all the, the ordinances. You know, I mean, I think, we, I think we've all through this process over the last two or three months seen lots of places where, you know, it could be tightened up as far as how the rules of engagement work. But... To me, it, we're having this meeting. The interim CEO is here. Plans have been submitted with the, with the June building permit. It's the responsibility of the, the CEO to ensure that all the building permits that have been issued are being, you know, adhered to properly per the plans. Yeah. That's all we can do as a board. I mean, that's. I guess the question I have for you, for you Attorney Wall, again, sorry, um, is, <laughs> is, is can, can, we, can we append, if you will, to our, our vote 
one way, you know, up or down on on this, an addendum that such that, you know, that we, we asked the CEO to inspect the property, ensure that the plans are being complied with. If they are, great. That's what the building permit provides. If, if, if not, then, you know, we, we, ex you know, we expect a, you know, some kind of cease of the work until more information is provided or something like that. Um, well, enforcement uh, of the ordinance is, uh, pursuant to the ordinance terms, is, is granted to the CEO and to the, and the town council. Um, anything that the zoning board would say in that regard would be entirely advisory. There would be no binding effect with, for any recommendation that they go out and take a look at it. It's, it's entirely up to the CEO and the town council to decide whether or not to take any kind of enforcement action on, on what's happening under so, a building permit. So once they go and they do their job, they make the determination as to whether there's been a violation or not, and then the, you know, the wheels of justice can, you know, proceed. Precisely, yeah. Um, Attorney Branson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm John Bannon on behalf of the Mallory's. It's a little hard to know where to begin. Um, I sympathize with this board's interest in seeing that permits are issued correctly. But there is absolutely no reason for this board to think that my clients do not want to follow the law. You've heard innumerable accusations against them. It's not up to the Freedmen's to enforce the ordinance. It's up to the code enforcement officer to enforce the ordinance. He, maybe it'll be you, Mike, maybe it'll be a successor, I don't know, but you will find out what happened and you will decide whether there has been any violations or not. Not the Freedmen's, good grief. You've heard no backup to what you've been told on any of these things. I could get up here and say any number of things about the Freedmen's that I'd care to say. And I would not expect you to say, well, Bannon said it, mm, must be something to it. Why should you believe me? I'm not the person who reports on these things. It's the code enforcement officer. I sympathize with the board's interest in, uh, I started this in a different way. I uh, appreciate the board's interest in seeing that permits are issued correctly no matter what the timing is. And you know what? I argued that and I lost. That's the case of Wright versus Town of Kenny Bunkport. And I argued exactly the point that you're making, that if a permit is granted incorrectly, it shouldn't matter how much time's gone by. If it's wrong, it's wrong, and then the appeal period uh, shouldn't apply. And I lost, and I'm pissed, but I lost, and that's the way it is. That's the law of, of this state. Um, and there's nothing that I can do about it, and there's nothing that this board can do about it. There is no case that says that this board can possibly determine whether there's a flagrant miscarriage of justice or any of any other aspects of the good cause exception. There's just no case. Uh, Attorney Wall has already told you that in prior, um, in prior appeals. That's exactly what Brackett says. That's what Gagne says. That's what Viles says. That's what all of those cases say. Maybe we'd all like it to work differently, but that's not what the law is. The law right now is that if an appeal is untimely, the Zoning Board of Appeals shuts down, it dismisses the appeal as untimely, and then the courts sort it out. There's nothing wrong with that scheme. It's been working pretty well for 20-something years, um, and there's no reason to change it now. I do have a, a couple of comments to make. Um, this board uh, has a submission deadline for documentation of uh, 14 days before the hearing. I never saw any of these tabs until today. Neither did you, I don't think. 
this information should not be before you. It should have been presented to you at least 14 days before this hearing, as it should have been permitted, uh, submitted to me. I've never seen it, and this board should not consider it either. I have heard nothing about any opinions by any architects about anything. This, this is all, okay, excuse me. <clears throat> Whether my clients have complied with the law is something that the code enforcement officer will determine. If my clients have violated the law, they will not get away with it. My clients have no interest in violating the law or getting away with it. I promise you that. And there is no reason, simply because uh, accusations have been leveled at my clients, completely unfounded ones, by the way, there, uh, I'm, I'm all over the place here, but there is no procedure within this zoning ordinance, and please ask your town attorney by which this project would ever go in front of the planning board. There is no cause under which it would. That is just false. There is no hearing that, these, that the Freedmans or anybody else could get on this kind of a permit based on what this building permit was. I'm sorry, but it's just not true. Um, so, to sum up, we do know what the law is. Uh, the town attorney's already told you what the law is. The law is that if the 30 days have gone by, the, uh, the Board of Appeals has to dismiss it and let it go to the next step, which is either the code enforcement officer or the court or both. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah. Yeah, and I'd like to just briefly read from a letter I wrote on December 8th to, to both John Bannon and Martha Gaithwaite on a request uh, from Attorney Gaithwaite to uh, stop work on the project. What I wrote was, and it, it, it ties back to the questions you were asking earlier, uh, I defer to the ZBA on validity and timeliness issues and deny the request for a stop work order on the existing permit. As interim code enforcement officer and as town manager, it is my intent to honor all permits issued by Mr. Smith unless the original permit application contains consequential erroneous information upon which he based his decisions. The town also will be inspecting all permit locations to be sure the permit conditions are being followed. If a party believes that construction activities are occurring outside the plan submitted and approved as part of the permit application, the town will consider enforcement action. In this instance, I am not aware of any allegation involving non-conformance with the granted permit. And no, no, no issues have been brought to me since I sent that letter on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you. Just so the record is clear, I have not asked you to accept what I had stated at face value. That is why I have submitted the packet of information. Most of it was not available until um, the last few days. In fact, I received from Attorney Bannon today a copy of the plans that apparently were provided to the town last Monday. I received a copy of the transcript of the deposition today with respect to the photograph of Mr. Uh, Mallory measuring into the nine foot setback. That again is something that I don't think is disputed. I could have told you that that's what uh, the fact is out at 40 Surf Road, but I thought it was more important for you to not have to take my word for it. It has been my intention and my client's intention to try to resolve this matter with neighbors without having to get to the point that we are now. It is unfortunate that the Mallory's decided to go forward and not let my clients have their day before you so that you could call it the way you see it. That is all they're asking for. They are asking for you to just reach the merits of it. If we have misinterpreted the statute, if we have misinterpreted the plans, if we have misunderstood what the scope of the code enforcement officer's jurisdiction is, so be it. My clients would have accepted that decision. But I repeat that I think it is manifestly unfair and unjust for them not to be given that opportunity when they were not given notice of this project. I also believe 
that this matter is conceptually different than the Livingston versus Murphy matter because in that circumstance, they had notice and for whatever reason chose not to file an appeal. And it is my understanding from what I know about that matter, we don't have a situation where the permit application says one thing and the construction shows something else. I understand it's late. I very much appreciate your time and your patience and your consideration. We feel very strongly that we have a merit uh, to this appeal. We would ask you to consider it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I didn't have to send Martha those plans. I did it because I thought that was fair. And that's why I did it. And I did it as fast as I could. I would also like you to look at the letter that I sent to you uh, some time ago. I want to remind you of something. In the 2000 application, or the application for the 2000 building permit for the Mallory residence, there were plans that showed this addition. The Friedman saw construction begin. If they'd wanted to see what the plans were, they had eons of time to go and look at them down at Town Hall, and they would have seen that this addition had been planned since 2007. This is no big surprise. This is something that's been coming for five years. And for them to suddenly say, this is amazing, we never would have expected this to happen, is incredible. I apologize, but based on that, I really would ask that you hear from Mary Friedman, who will explain to you why, in being a good neighbor, it falls under the category of no good deed goes unpunished. She can explain to you what happened back in 2009. I also would note that the Garmies and the Lakaris, who are neighbors, have submitted letters. I'm not sure if that's part of your board packet, but they support the Friedman's position. Um, I, I, I can appreciate wanting to talk to the, you know, speak to the ZBA, and uh, you know, I, I, I think that we're. Um, probably at the point where um, we've gotten a pretty good lay of the land. I can, uh, I'd like to, at this point, I think, close the floor to debate and talk about this amongst ourselves. I guess I'll, I'll start, because it is, I mean, I think after listening to it, Town Council and um, you know the, our, exp our experience with um, other recent uh, appeals before uh, the zoning board. I, I you know we don't have uh, any discretion around um, the 30-day appeal period, and uh, I, I think while the circumstances uh, might be slightly different. Um, as far as who knew what when, um, for better or for worse, it's beyond the 30 days. And um, there, there are other jurisdictions that um, are available, which I think, frankly, have already been, uh, uh, have been availed um, to, to address this issue. Um, and my feeling is that um, you know, really at this point, the appeal, um, you know, at least from my perspective personally, not as the chair, is, is that um, the appeal should be denied because of uh, the timeliness issue. You know, I think um, some attorneys disagree with you that we don't have uh, the discretion. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. But, but let me ask John Ma. Uh, John, in your opinion, do we have any discretion with respect to the 30 days? Um, as I had previously indicated, I've, I've looked at this issue, and, and I do not believe that, the, um, that this board, which is a, a board of limited powers, has the inherent ability to 
um, grant the kind of good cause exception that the, the law court has mm -hmm. talked about. The law court has specifically made reference to the good cause exception as a judicial um, function rather than an administrative function. And courts have inherent powers that boards, which are created under limited, <coughs> with limited powers, do not have. And I think for both of those reasons, the court decided that it was more appropriate, more preferable, to have uh, the courts decide whether or not a good cause exception should apply in a particular situation. <clears throat> so um, the parties here will certainly have an opportunity to present their arguments at the superior court level to the, the forum that the law court has said is the appropriate place to deal with these issues. But, but in my opinion, based on the case law, the, this board does not have the, the, the power to grant such a, an exception. Okay, you think that that's really, uh, that's firm and that's it? There's no discretion. That, that is my opinion based upon everything I've read, yes. Okay, so maybe we shouldn't even accept cases like that. You know, save time, same time, but save time. Uh, we just sort of waste our time. I thought we could do almost anything. It's a board, it's a, it's a board of appeal. And you know, if we make a mistake, then people go to court and they overturn us. Isn't the Zoning Board of Appeal so sort of one way to do something that uh, uh, the, the book says you can't do, but you want to do, so you, will, you appeal to a higher order. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Well, I do no, understand, you want, but... You want to build a house, you want to build it maybe three feet higher. You can't. The, the, the code is very clear. You go to ZBA, ZBA gives you the permission. Well, That's what I thought we did. And there are a couple of things that the ZBA does, and one of them is grant a variance, which in some instances can address the, the variance, situation right. that you're talking about. We did one of those tonight, Barry. Where was I? <laughs> no, but, but, I but, but what I'm suggesting... Uh, well, just, I'm just trying to clarify this 30-day business. Because if it's firm, and one has to go to Superior Court, then we waste time you know, hearing the presentations. Because it's not going to work, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we get that word out through, through your office? I'm listening. <laughs> well, obviously, every, every appeal, I mean, the, the parties to an appeal should have the ability to, to try and establish to the board that, in fact, it is timely under the 30-day period. So okay, not, not every case can be disposed of quite that easily. But, no, but if it, if I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. But if it's over 30 days, if it's 33 days, it's over, it's over 30. I mean, what, what movement can you have in, within that? There is none. I guess well, that kind of goes to my question about the, the changing nature of the application. And I, I don't know that that's been kind of clearly answered for me, but it sounds like there were new new plan submitted for some reason as yet undefined as recently as last week and does that toll the appeal period such that you know and I understand that the the code enforcement officer and the town manager said you know there was no application for amendment to the permit with that plan but I'm saying it, I guess my question is whether that's dispositive on the appeal period given that um, it, why would you submit an amended application if you can just submit plans and not have that be automatically an amendment but if you are still in as matter of fact changing your application doesn't that change the appeal period but you weren't submitting we're just sending it, sending it. I mean, there's no What's application. What's the difference? Well, I'll tell you why. Because perhaps the feeling was, look, maybe they'll accept it. They'll slip it in the file. Because there's a procedure. Any attorney that's handling these knows what you have to do to make changes. You don't just put it in an envelope and mail it. I mean, that's, think about that. As an attorney, you wouldn't do that, would you? I mean, and the recipient of that kind of a uh, plan really mocks on it, receives it on a certain date, and doesn't act on it, and I don't think it has any meaning. You file it because it, was, it, it came in the mail. But it has no validity. There's no application with it. There's no cover letter. The, uh, it's a question. Plan, uh, when plans are submitted with the original building permit that's being issued. Right. Okay. Well, that's and it. can those plans be amended and still fall under the original building permit? But there'd be a process to do it. That, right? No, I'm sorry, asking you a question. Time manager okay. of the interim code, infest, code enforcement officer. You know, usually that would constitute an amendment to the permit if the if the if the permit actually changes. It, it could be it could be on the original permit, but it'd be an amendment to the permit 
and then if the amendment, if the permit was amended, that starts a new 30-day period on the amendment itself. So, so if if plans as submitted <coughs> for a permit are subsequently amended, then that always results in an amended permit, or sometimes. No, you know, I I, I don't know what, you know, John. I don't know what the plan is. I presume what what they were doing was beefing up the record with, with calculations on the earlier permit. We. We do the, do that with with other permits. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll look at you know someone will ask a question, and you know there, there's another one which could be appealed to. I got to be careful what I say, but you know it's still within the 30-day period. There was something missing in the file. We met with the folks, said you know we got to make sure this is right, and uh, they submitted additional information. But shouldn't it be returned to them? But we didn't. But it's still the same permit. It's nothing has changed in terms of what the permit allowed to, to be done. It's a clarification of... It's, it's a clarification of beefing up of the record, a, a dotting of the I, a crossing of the T, but it doesn't change substantively anything other than building up a record. Is it the same permit? I mean, was it the same plan or change? The one that just came in, I, I, on this case? Well, no, the one that just came in that was mailed to you. That didn't have a I, letter. I didn't, I don't know if it was, I think someone dropped it off. I, I don't know if, I think it was dropped. Was it dropped off? I don't know. Well, okay. It just showed up. Someone told me this came in. I said, make sure Attorney Gaithwaite knows about it. Throw it in the file. That was, that was the extent of it. Okay. Would you like an explanation of the plan? I don't, I don't, I don't need an explanation. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Oh, that was the plan. <laughs> right. Mr. Chair, if there's nothing else, I'll take my seat again. Yeah, you're I keep leaving you up there, don't I, Attorney? Sure. Any other comments? Ready to take a vote on this? Can I just ask one other question? I'm sorry, one question. Don't give me a dirty look. It's okay. I didn't. I rolled John, my it, eyes instead. <laughs> Here's a question. No, well, no, just stay there. It's okay. Right, it's got to go there. Oh, I apologize. You need that, right? In the event we can't do something like the 30, go beyond the 30 days, but if we did it, what happens? Would well, it would be, invalid. It would be whatever you did would be invalid. Be, wait, wait, wait. Who said this? All right, but the validity is announced by whom? It would have to be the Superior the Court? The, the Superior Court would tell you it's invalid. Right. But that's a process, too, isn't it? <laughs> and Did you have to get a hearing? Who wants to take for a hearing? I beg your pardon? How long does it take for a hearing? Uh, I, I don't know. If you appeal to the Superior Court on the basis that we did something that we're not authorized to do, does that take a long time to get heard in the Superior Court? It, I suppose it could, yeah. I, I, think, I think these processes are usually done under administrative appeals under Rule ADP, which tend to be a little faster, but there's no definite time frame. What's the okay, you've answered my question. Thank you. Can make okay. motion. Would, would anyone like to make a motion on, are we ready to make a motion on this? Let's, let's, I am if you guys are. Any further debate? Sorry. So, um, I guess I'd just like to go back to my prior question and just get clarity for the record that because there was no application for an amendment, to the extent additional information came in after the June permit was issued that substantively changed the application, or to the extent the application was not consistent with what's actually being done out there, that is not authorized, and at some point in the not too distant future will be inspected by the town and addressed. Is that right? That's a question for you. Yeah, I, I go back to what I read before, and, and that's that uh, the town's going to be inspecting all permit locations to be sure the permit conditions are met, and the permit will stand unless the original permit application contains consequential erroneous information upon which he bases his decision. If, if I have information presented to me, and that challenge, that's something I will review, I'll get legal advice on. Furthermore, if a party believes that construction activities are occurring outside the plans submitted and approved, the town will consider enforcement action. 
and at the time I wrote this, I was not aware of any allegation involving nonconformance with the granted permit, and I'm not sure if I was presented any this evening. I, uh, we were presented something. I'm not sure exactly if it met that standard. But for example, those plans that came in on Monday, just because they're in the file doesn't mean that they're approved. No, it just means they're part of the overall record of, of the zoning board review of this material. It just shows that it's in the, it's in the file. You know, so if someone did discovery, I suppose they could use, both sides could use it because it's in the file. You're the lawyer, I'm not, but that's my sense of what's going on. How do you mark it? Do you mark it? Usually when something comes in, it's marked the date received. Okay. Any further questions, debate, observations? Okay. Would anyone like to make a motion on this appeal? I'll make a motion. <laughs> Way to go, Jeff. Um, let's see how I want to write it. Uh, I'll make a motion to deny the administrative appeal by Harold and Mary Friedman uh, as a result of it being untimely, pursuant to section 19-5-3 of our code. Thank you. Joanna, you second to that? We both did. Oh. Take your picture. Did you, want, did you want to look at the findings of fact in terms of the, put the dates into the record, the, the draft findings that when the permit was filed? And, Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Okay, uh, why don't I read the findings of facts? Um, Harold and Mary Friedman reside at and own 36 Surf Road, which abuts the subject property. All in favor? Opposed? Uh, on June 6, 2012, a building permit application on 40 Surf Road was received to add an addition on a second on the second floor above a pre-existing roof and for a new mudroom. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? The application was assigned permit number 120434. In favor? Opposed? A permit was granted on June 8, 2012 with the permit number 120434 assigned with a building permit place card having the number 109994. All in favor? Opposed? On November 5, 2012, an administrative appeal was filed on behalf of Harold and Mary Friedman, questioning the authority of the code enforcement officer to issue the June 8, 2012 permit. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Um, we have a motion before the board, seconded, uh, to deny the administrative appeal of Harold and Mary Friedman um, based upon uh, lack of timeliness under 15-5-3. All those in favor of the denial? Opposed? Carries unanimous. Okay, we're getting used to that, actually. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> want to go thank you. These. It's not 12. It's, we're doing all right. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Oh, 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 sorry. sorry. Before we adjourn, there was some discussion about um, the ordinance committee's meeting right now to revise it. I know it's late. Is there some type of, and I know this would just be advisory, yeah. some sort of language that we can just put on the record for that Answer. committee? Maybe I could try to help you with it. The, the ordinance committee doesn't get anything directly. It goes to the town council. The town council refers it to the ordinance committee. If you, if you have some issues or concerns with the, the notification procedures that we have regarding when building permits are issued, m my suggestion would be you, you might appro approve a motion 
to ask your, your chairman to prepare a letter for you to consider at your next meeting uh, to the town council outlying concerns with the notification procedure for building permits. And I, and I, and I think that, you know, if, you know, we should, we should collectively, you know, try and circulate a <coughs> letter amongst us. Because I think we all, I think, I think there are restrictions on our ability to interact outside of right, the official board meetings. No, that's true. By the way, you know, you can, uh, you're not reinventing the wheel. Other towns do this and have systems. I, I, I know that uh, that's an easy thing to do. And even you define things, like how do you define uh, notify our butters? Well, you know, you, you pick maybe within a mile or something like that, and you'd make a circle. But other towns have done something, I think, that would solve and, this. And other towns also have, give the zoning board power to find that there are good cause exceptions for the 30-day limitation. So, I mean, there's, there's different ways that these problems can be avoided in the future. And so we, you know, we should, I think, <coughs> individually, um, you know, we've seen enough here over the last two or three months where I think we need to alert our uh, town council and our CEO. And well, I think the town council just needs to watch the video of the past couple of hearings to see the issues that we're struggling they're with. They're watching. I think simply... They're gonna, I'm sure they're going to enjoy my saying that, but, but I think that that's really... We, we, can, we can circulate recommendations, but I'm not sure that on a piece of paper it's truly going to reflect the issues and what the board goes through when these decisions come before it without actually watching it or, or sitting here and, and seeing it. And I think, I mean, I, I say that, but I, 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 I say that in all sincerity, that I think that they need to take a look and, and watch the video of these issues to see if there's a way to get it addressed. Because, our, 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 you know, we're going to follow what the, what, the, what, what the zoning ordinance says. That's it. I mean, that's and, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just it's going to cost the town more money because then there are going to be appeals because it's not within the 30 days and then the town has to pay town council more money for the appeals and then it ends up back in front of the board. Mm. So, I mean, I think things can be done. I don't, I don't think there are huge changes, but changes can be made that would... A lot of it's wrong notification. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it seems Even like if it's not notification because that's too expensive, just requiring commencement of construction before the appeal period terminates. I mean, then the people that are concerned about it know about it, right? Well, I mean, but you could have notification in the Cape right. Courier. But any number, <coughs> there's any number of ways to address yeah. the issue so that people that are coming in and saying, I didn't know that this was going to happen and it's horrible that it's happening. Yeah. can have a voice about it. Just a there, there are many different ways of doing it, and part of what the Ordinance Committee would look at when the Council referred it to them are all the different mechanisms, including po requirements to post on site at the front of the property line. You see that in a lot of different jurisdictions. There, there are many different ways of doing it. I think the interim CEO's comment is basically exactly what I would recommend the vote yeah. being, which is simply recommending that the uh, ordinance committee look to surrounding towns and communities, see how they deal with this issue, look at what approaches are out there, and decide amongst them what would be the best to address the situation, as opposed to us giving them explicit um, requests to them to, to A, B, or C as a way other, to provide Other than to just do something. Do something, yeah. exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> do something. So our, I, I, I would propose. I don't know. How, I don't know. So if you're so specific, to Chris. To do something, but. <laughs> All right. A anything else before the? Uh, yes, before? December 26th. Thought we were doing. Oh that. right. Yeah. After. Yeah. The camera. Yeah. Okay. You should discuss that though while you're technically still in session. Okay. Yeah. So with that, we'll sign off. Yeah. Can we turn the video off? Just going to be discussing when the December meeting is and. So we don't discuss everyone's personal schedule. We'll do it off air. But if anyone wishes to confirm when the next meeting is, they can call the office tomorrow. We'll let them know. The discussion is different.